Well, good evening, everybody. Our closed session ran a little late. I appreciate your patience out here waiting for us. I would uh, like to go ahead and call the or uh, meeting to order and ask everyone to please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag, to the flag of the United, United States of America, of America and, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, under God indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much, and again, welcome to the February 12th meeting of the Placerville City Council. Um, could the clerk please call the roll? Mayor Acuna? Here. Councilmember Borelli? Here. Vice Mayor Saragosa? Here. Councilmember Taylor? Here. Councilmember Thomas? Here. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Regina. Moving on to item 3.1. Uh, this is an opportunity for the council to uh, address the public. Are there any count council member comments this evening? I will start on my left. Vice Mayor Saragosa. Um, no, I do not have any. Thank you. Council Member Thomas. I do have a few notes. Sure. Um, I was not I was absent last meeting, so I had a little catch up to do tonight. Uh, I did meet with Chief Ortega and took a tour of the police station and discovered what how little space they really have to work in and how efficient they are with that space and you definitely uh, do a good job of utilizing every inch of it um, I attended I know you guys talked about it a little bit but I attended the three-day workshop for uh, new council members put on by the uh, League of California cities and it was it was three days of an intensive experience of everything to do with cities um, it was a wealth of information talking about the challenges and recognizing a lot of the challenges that we face in the city, dealing with financing, with revenue, um, projecting out the revenue and what it's going to look like. Um, uh, the legislative, we talked a lot about the legislative process and what's going to be happening or what proposed, what the governor's proposing to do with the housing element and the things he's tying that to. And it's, um, it's going to be interesting, this new environment in the state as they move forward. Um, let's see what else do we talk about uh, having an efficient meeting with a with a city manager and how to not take up too much of his time was a big <laughs> was a big topic I think that one was put on by a city manager actually <clears throat> and I wanted to point out a couple people during the storm we had the big storm there was two guys that really stepped up downtown one was Todd Pickett and he was out there in the almost up to his knees in water clearing the drains because it was literally inches away from going into to, uh, several businesses and if he hadn't have done that they would have flooded and there's another gentleman up here just up the street just a little bit um, what was his name Michael Mitchell and he has that blue house next to the independent and he um, he was doing the same thing he must have cleared out about six or seven drains to keep the the businesses from flooding up there so real kudos to those guys to step up in a tough situation there um, Another thing we did, Cleve and myself, Kevin Brown and Mickey Kaiserman, we met. Um, there was two members from the peak. We met with uh, the gentleman from the uh, fiber broadband uh, group, and we discussed moving forward with what it looks like running uh, fiber through the city and to every house. And that's it's a long-range project, but we're, we, we pushed that back to... Um, back to peak and hopefully they'll be coming to the uh, council with some recommendations on how to move that forward uh, sorry for the length of this I was gone for a whole month uh, <laughs> I did meet with uh, El, Dorado, uh, El Dorado County Transportation Commission uh, Woodrow um, Deloria and he kind of got me up to speed on everything transportation in the county met with several people and he was one of them it's it was very uh, interesting understanding how the the city and the uh, county interact uh, when it comes down to all the millions of dollars that goes through this county for for funding met with Terry Lamonchek also from El Dorado uh, Arts Council is it El Dorado Arts Council Art Council and uh, she it was that was an eye-opener understanding how how important it is it wasn't an eye-opener but I recognize how important it is for um, the arts and what they do for our community in terms of bringing art to it and it's something that's that I think is understated in, in the value that they bring to our community and then I met with Rebecca and and we went over everything to do with how the EDCTC interacts with the city and 
that was important because I, as a representative of the city on the EDCDC, I want to make sure and one represents and not step on a lot of toes because we want to get as much of those dollars coming into our city as possible. So that's it for now. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. And we're glad to have you back. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Councilmember Borelli. I don't have any reports. All right, well, thank you. Councilmember Taylor. Um, I've got a couple of comments. I, as a new council member, I've been trying to uh, become oriented with the city departments, and I just want to thank Mr. Rebus, Mr. Warren, Mr. Ortega, and Ms. Neves for their time uh, bringing me up to speed on all the different departments. I still need to reach out to Public Works and Park and Rec, but that will be coming soon um, to meet with you and, and learn more about those departments as well. I attended the fire safety workshop here and um, just really appreciate all the local organizations that came out and participated in public outreach. And um, last week I attended the Sacramento Valley Regional Climate Symposium, which was put on by the Capital Region Climate Readiness Collaborative, which is a mouthful. Um, and that really stressed the need to, for cities and uh, counties to plan and adapt for um, the changing climate and um, kind of provided a lot of resources for updated climate models. Um, so that was interesting, uh, a little discouraging, but uh, definitely, definitely worth attending. So that's all my comments. Thank you, Council Member Taylor. Appreciate your attending that. That's mm -hmm. an important future topic that is going to be more and more on our radar. Oh, thank you. Uh, just hey, Mr. Mr. Mayor. Oh, um, yes, sir. I don't know if this would be the right time or maybe later, but one thing I was thinking about is I know we have some vacancies on boards and commissions. I was wondering if we couldn't do another quick announcement on that just to get it out to the public once more uh, about some of those that are out there. Um, actually, we were going to do it a little later in the meeting. I don't okay. know if, uh, Regina, that, are you prepared to do it now? Because we have a big audience now. Later on, <laughs> you never know the ratings drop. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Um, yes, uh, uh, due to the lack of applications that we have received for the two commissions, the Planning Commission and the Parks and Recreation Commission, we would like to extend the application period by two more weeks to allow for more, um, to allow for more uh, community members to um, uh, submit their applications. Um, we should have enough to go forward with interviews for the committees, however. Um, and the current members, the current commissioners that are sitting um, in those expired, expiring terms will uh, be seated until, they're, um, until those applicants are chosen for those seats. Right. And Regina, the, uh, the original closing date was this Thursday for the filing? It was tomorrow, oh, tomorrow by 5 p.m., so we'll, we'll extend it by so two more two weeks more, from tomorrow. Two more weeks, two more Wednesdays. All right. And that is for the Planning Commission vacancies and the Park and Recreation Commission. That is correct. Right. Right. So and the other ones will go forward, the other um, Yes, we'll move forward with the committees. Yes, H&L, uh, Sales Tax Committee, and um, Placerville Economic Advisory Committee. And that is a interview process that's going to be taking place next week? That will take place uh, next week. I haven't yet reached out to the candidates because we haven't closed the application period yet, but that will take place um, at City Hall, it uh, will not be open to the public. It's just taken care of by the interview subcommittee. Well, thank you very much for being prepared for that, <laughs> Regina. You're thank you for asking it. I appreciate it, Michael. It's important, to, especially the two big committees, two commissions. Um, moving on, I will go ahead and make a couple of brief comments. The, uh, I would like to, again, thank our public works crews and probably our uh, police department staff that was working the night of the various storms it seemed to be all of a sudden we have winter in february now and uh, quite a bit of a quite a change and some some very big challenges so i would just like to thank our interim uh, director of public works mr nick stone for your fine job and the direction of your troops and getting the roads cleared and keeping the trees out of the way and so on and so forth so thank, thank you your, your efforts are greatly appreciated by all of the citizens. Um, well, if no other comments, I will move on to item 3.2, which is a Caltrans update, which I did reach out to the director of uh, the Eldorado County Transportation Commission, Woodrow, and uh, he did provide me some information, which I, of course, promptly left on my printer this afternoon. But I do have a little bit of it in mind, um, a bit of an alarm. Caltrans, um, 
is now finally putting a uh, project team together. Um, I would have hoped that given the impact that this, and this is the Mosquito, the Highway 50 Mosquito Bridge Overcrossing Bridge on Mainline Highway 50. Um, what we do know now is that they are proposing a 12-day uh, reduction to one lane in each direction. Um, they have some dates in April and they have a date in May. Uh, and unfortunately, I, I don't have that with me, but they are they are beginning to hone it in. Clave, do you, I have those do dates you have it with you? Do you want the dates? Sure, that would be helpful. They're proposing either April 1st through April 12th or April 22nd through May 3rd. And of course, it's weather permitting because they have to reduce Highway 50 to one lane in each direction and do their concrete work. Um, I uh, Hopefully, we'll hear more tomorrow and we'll find out what their plans are for community outreach. Um, if it was my project, I've already, I would have already had one or two meetings, given the impact that this is, this is going to affect delivering a loaf of bread in this county. Little, never mind ambulances and school buses and everything else. So I, I will be honest, I am disappointed that, uh, that some things have already not taken place as far as community communication on this. Any other, any comments from council on, on that particular Didn't item? Didn't say that they were, they were going to provide more signage? Um, I'm not, you know, at this point I'm going to say I don't know. We, I, I we need that, to push and find out. Got that out of yeah. the conversations. So. Yeah. We'll, we'll definitely need, to need our Woodrow Deloria to help us over at Transportation yeah. Commission yeah. to make sure that uh, uh, we get the appropriate uh, communi communication and involvement from our community. At, yes, sir. At, at the last uh, transportation meeting, they did, a representative from Caltrans did come by and talk about doing an outreach as well as. Um, improving and th they understood the, the 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 lack of signage on the last one and so they have taken that seriously going forward and they also talked about doing a community outreach but they didn't give the dates of that so they are it is top of mind for them and they will be working on that well, thank you for that all right, all right. moving on to item 3.3 .3, acknowledge and file a workers compensation trend trending report Mr. Warren, good evening, sir. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Tonight we have Dory Zumwalt, account executive from York Risk Services, to present the report. With that, I'll hand it over to Dory. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Hi again. So we're going to go over just the trends over the last five years for the city of their workers' compensation claims. So the first slide is all the different claims that have come in year over year. So we'd like to see more blues and greens and less of the reds. However, as you can see on this, this year for 17, 18, we have more indemnity claims, which are claims where um, it's not just medical treatment, it's compensation for their inability to work. Um, so that number has gone higher. However, the paid is significantly lower than it's been in previous years. So even with the increase in claims, the dollar amount still went down, which is fantastic. So the chart below goes over the how much was paid and how much is reserved for the claim to pay out the claim. Any questions on those? So the next slide is how much we have paid on the city's claims regardless of the date of injury. So the other charts went through how much we paid for the claims that came in during each fiscal year. This includes all the claims even back to the 1980s. And again, uh, our, our cost was a little bit lower than, it, than it's been for the past three years. The next chart is the recoveries that have been received. And I just like to throw that in just to show that sometimes we get some money back as well. Generally, this is through the excess insurance. So the city's claims are self-insured through the pool, Northern California City Self-Insurance Fund. And any claims over a specific dollar amount, you receive reimbursement from the excess carrier. And also, if there's any motor vehicle accidents or damage caused by a third party, we can also collect recovery as well. And the next chart is fantastic. So this shows the lost days with... Um, during each fiscal year for the claims that came in. So we'd like to see the lost days lower, obviously, because that reduces your costs. 
So for this last year, there was very low amount of lost days. And so the way we can do that is by offering modified duty and working with the physicians in the area to release injured workers back to modified duty. Sometimes there's nothing that can be done. If the doctor takes them off work, if they have a highly physical job, they're unable to do that, then obviously they're going to have some lost days. The chart below is the closing ratio. So I like to see it as 100%. So however many close or claims come in, we'd like to be able to close that many. So it's it's a little um, skewed when you see that middle year, how high that middle year is. That was clearly an above average year, yay. Um, but then this last fiscal year, we continued at 100%, which is where we want to, we'd like to see it. So now I'm going to go into some more of the injury trends. So these next charts talk about the different injuries that have come in over the past five years. And so I like to look at this for risk management purposes to see if there's, if there's a pattern or if there's anything that we can do to um, put some risk management efforts, some risk control efforts to reduce our, our costs. So in looking at this, the biggest cause of injury is a strain or cumulative trauma. Cumulative trauma claims are across across the state for public entities, the most expensive claims there are. I like to think of it in terms of like going to a dentist. If you go to the dentist right when your tooth starts hurting, generally they can take care of it right away. Versus if you wait, you know, a few months, whatever's going on with your tooth, it's a lot worse. It costs a lot more. Same thing with accumulative trauma. So if you can, if you if you notice that you're in pain, and if you can get to the doctor right away, it's usually cheaper versus accumulative trauma where it's a long time. Generally, the cumulative trauma that we see are for backs and for knees. Um, the next chart is the the body parts that's injured. Now, the city of Placerville is unique in that uh, one of your top injuries is for your fingers. That's rare. It's usually low back, knees, and multiple body parts. Um, but back is there and knee is there. The next chart is um, goes over the, the nature of the injury. And um, although a contusion, if you can see that red line spikes up really high. So you would think a contusion claim would be you know, pretty inexpensive, but there was one claim um, where the injured worker fell, and it originally looked like a contusion, and it turned into a lot, a lot worse, which is why that that amount is higher. And then also, again, the cumulative trauma type claims have a lot more cost, a lot more severity involved. The um, top occupation, police always wins. I don't think I've ever, <laughs> yay. <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen um, police not win the this uh, race, um, and that's just the nature of the that's just the nature of the job, right? You never know what you're going to come against, and you have a lot more hazards in your occupation than um, than I do. And um, this chart makes me so happy. Um, I put together the top 10 claims that the city's had over the past five years. And if you can look at the paid for the 10th highest claim, it's only $875. That is fantastic. That is great. Um, the most expensive claim has settled. It's, it's resolved now. So we'll see that we won't see an increase in, um, in that severity because that claims done um, but I look at this to see if there's uh, any lessons learned and most of those injuries are the cumulative trauma either to you know the knee um, wrist low back and then also hearing so there's there's not a whole lot sorry Dave there's just not a whole lot that we can do if I saw a whole bunch of trip and falls or or lifting injuries then um, we can usually do more but with those cumulative traumas they're a little harder any questions on that awesome slide okay so now I just have the the injuries by department and the reason why I put it in here is because I showed you how 
police won the, the race. They had the most claims. But I also wanted to show you that proportionally it's not as expensive, um, which is which is great news for the police department. So the average indemnity workers' comp claim is over thirty thousand. I'm sorry, thirty thousand dollars. So um, the average claim for the police department is only twelve thousand. So again, for the state of California, it's about thirty thousand. For the for the um, city, it's only twelve. For the police department. And then the next slides I have is, is um, like I said before, the city belongs to a pool. And so I included the other members, there's 22 members, and I included the other members just as a benchmark to see, to see how Placerville is doing. And um, your average claim is $7,800. Again, the state average is, is over 30, so fantastic job there. And one quick comment on that. Um, when you look at these agencies, they vary in size, but uh, Auburn, Oroville, and Red Bluff have similar size payrolls as Placerville, and we're well below at uh, $7,812 as compared to those three other cities uh, of similar size. So good news. Any other questions? Any questions from the Council for Dory on the presentation? Well, no, Thank I just like to say I always enjoy hearing from her. She is I so she really makes this interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And you do it with such a nice smile on your face, <laughs> and that makes it even better. <laughs> Thank you. I actually love workers' compensation, so it's it's a good thing, and it you know is hopefully helping our employees to help help them through this scary time when they do have an injury, and it's always great to report good news. So thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you for coming and seeing us again this year, and. Uh, Congratulations to all the members of the, the all yeah. the city employees because um, they all work many long hours and many uh, dangerous situations and uh, challenging weather conditions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and it's um, this is it's it's a testament to their staying focused on what they're doing and working safe, working probably as a team, making sure that they don't get each other in a situation where they're going to reflect and no one wants to be hurt. And so um, congratulations to the whole city and their, for, to our staff for maintaining the, I think we are number four on your, on the, in the list of, as far as expenses go. And so. Right. And as Dave mentioned, that size of city makes a difference too. So you guys are doing fantastic. Well, thank you very much. We look forward to seeing you again next year with the same smile. Perfect. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> the same, same positive good trends. <laughs> thank All right. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thanks for coming up and visiting us again. All right. If you could put us back in the limelight, please, uh, Madam Clerk, I'd appreciate it. Thank you very much. Um, hey, did, we wanted to just amend the agenda when we get to adopting the agenda. Do you want me to consider those changes, moving those things? I, I, I would say, why don't you just handle 15.1 now? You okay, can do that, sure. And it's just an informational item, and then you can I'll modify the agenda under for the, for the, the 12s. Next. For the numerous numbers of 12s, <laughs> we have a record-setting agenda this evening. All right, it's been uh, it's been requested that we move an item up this evening. So the next item that the council is going to consider is item 15.1. I believe Mr. Lishman has a staff report on this, and what this is. Is a verbal report regarding the El Dorado Community Foundation grant for the Monument Garden. And the Monument Garden is located at the corner of Main and Bedford Street. Good evening, Mr. Lishman. Yes, good evening, Mayor Kuna, members of the council. Um, I'm happy to announce that Community Pride was just notified they'll be receiving a $5,000 grant from the El Dorado Community Foundation. The grant will cover uh, the irrigation and drip system, trees, plants, flowers. And it will be very beneficial in helping complete the final phase of the Monument Garden project. I'd like to acknowledge Steve Yule and Kathy Lishman for submitting the grant application and Carrie Fryer for designing the landscape plan. We are planning to begin the landscaping in the spring while continuing to raise funds for pavers, boulders, and other costs related to the final phase. So with that, Community Pride is very grateful to the El Dorado Community Foundation for the grant, and we are very excited to get started on the landscaping. Well, thank you, Matt. Is there anyone here this evening that, uh, from this project that would like to address the council on this, this wonderful $5,000 award and move this project forward? 
seeing nobody approaching the council, so thank you for that. Uh, we'll go ahead now and uh, close session report. Good evening, Mr. Driscoll. Good evening, Mayor Acuna. Tonight, the council did not take reportable action in closed session on the items, with the exception of the uh, litigation of City of Placerville versus Wawat, where the council did not take action other than to reaffirm the prosecution of that case and the appointment of Mr. Samuel Emerson as attorney for the city in that case. Thank you very much, sir. Now we move on to item five, adoption of the agenda. At the request of the city manager. Um, there may be an interested party on that case here. I'm not sure. So maybe the if okay. mayor, you may want to ask if there's any comment on sure. that. Thank you, Mr. On the closed session items. Is there any member of the public uh, here this evening that wishes to address the council on the closed session matter that the city attorney just reported out on? Good evening. If you could please state your name for the record. Yeah, good evening. My name is Singh. And uh, if I would ask you to limit your comments to three minutes, please. All right. Thank you, sir. Uh, I'm here for City of Plaza versus Rawat. In that case, there are so many things happen which is really undermining the public trust. For example, without any participation of the public, it was called as public nuisance, means that the city officials can put a finger on any house, can say that this is a public nuisance without any facts from the public. Uh, so I will send some of the emails regarding this. And during the litigation, there are so many things happen. For example, the defendant does not live in Davis. But in the court, the Mr. Samuel Emerson said he, he, uh, she lives in the Davis. He put some notices, which is required by the law, put in the newspaper, which is circulating in Davis. So in other words, in short, that city can put finger on any house, can say public nuisance, can take away that house. Uh, so this is kind of, that really deteriorates the public trust. There are so many legal things have been happening. Now, I say one thing that, let's assume that this receiver is legally appointed, legally right. He was appointed in August. He did not do even a damn thing until now. So, even if there's the appointment of receiver, the whole case is about appointment of receiver, he should finish the job as soon as possible, within reasonable time. During the litigation, the court, as well as the city decided, three weeks time is a reasonable time. The same city says that uh, the receiver is not doing anything for many months, it's okay. In other words, now, receiver lives in Southern California. He lives in Southern California. The house conditions are deteriorate much worse than, than he was being appointed. He doesn't pay any insurance, he doesn't pay any mortgage, he's not doing any duty of receivership. So, but he's billing for $6,000. So what I'm saying that the city is finding a, 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 a means that put the finger on any house, declare public nuisance, and get the money, and get the whole house from that person. That's not the public wants. And that's how public trust is being deteriorated. So anyway, I will send the emails to all of you people, and you decide that how bad it is, uh, <laughs> you know, it's just like this, taking somebody's house without any justifications. And, and then during the, uh, the city officials, Mr. Pira is one of them, submitted declarations that this problem is there, this problem is there, this problem is there. Those problems were already approved by the city. So city is reversing its approval, saying that, oh, wow, well, we do not approve that. In other words, you get the permit and you fix those problems and they are being settled, then they are not being raised by the city anymore. Mr. Singh, could you conclude your comments, please? 
by, uh, I will send by emails all the details. All right. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Driscoll, just for the record, could you please um, note the address of the property in question? Certainly. 3095 Cedar Ravine. 3095 Cedar Ravine. Because this is pending litigation, the council will not be making any comments on it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Driscoll. All right. Now we'll move on to adoption of the agenda. And I've been requested by the city manager to consider moving item 12 point up, 12.8 um, before the other 12, before item 12.1. With that thought, is there a motion for approval? So move. <clears throat> second. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. 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 The agenda is adopted. Ceremonial matters. We have none this evening. Moving on to item seven, which is public comment. Uh, is there any written communication this evening, Mr. Morris? No. Thank you, sir. Moving on to oral comments. This is the time in the meeting where the public is invited to speak to the city council on any item that is not on this evening's agenda, we do ask that you limit your comments to three minutes and that your subject matter is relative to the work that is performed here at City Council meetings. Is there any member of the public that wishes to speak to the Council on a non-agendized item? If you could please come forward and state your name for the record, we would appreciate it. Sue Rodman, resident of Placerville. And I commented once before that we had three bollards at the uh, corner of Main and Sacramento Street, and the middle one was always getting destroyed. And I noticed that it's now been replaced by a planter, which looks good and is less likely to be taken out. So good, good job. Thanks for the follow-up on that, Sue. I understand that there's a permanent concrete patch underneath that planter so it can slide around to its heart content. <laughs> Is there any other member of the public wishing to address council on a non-agendized item? Seeing no one approaching the podium, I'll go ahead and close public comment for this evening and move the council on to item eight, the consent calendar. Is there any member of the council that wishes to uh, pull or ask a question on any of the items on this evening's consent like calendar? Uh, I'd like to pull item 8.4. For further discussion? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. Any other um, items that the council member wishes to have removed for further or comment? All right, before we move forward, I'll ask if there's any member of the public that wishes to address the council on any of the consent calendar items before us this evening. Sue Rodman again on item 8.6, the purchase of a 2019 Ford F-150 uh, for $30,000, um, using a California Department of General Services procurement to get a better price. And I noticed that in the staff report it said that they were originally approved to get two pickup trucks for the Community Services Department. And they deferred that second truck due to its engine being replaced recently. So purchase of just one truck for $30,000 saves $32,542.03, which I think is very good management of our financial resources. So I think the community service departments gets a gold star. All right. Thank you, Sue. Appreciate you uh, recognizing the efforts of uh, our various departments, trying to stretch our dollars, making sure that we're buying the right things from the right dealers, etc. All right, I will, uh, if there are any other member of the public wishing to come in on consent calendar items, I will ask for a motion for the approval of the balance of the consent calendar. Move the item. Second. Been moved and seconded. Uh, the second was from Vice Mayor Saragossa. Uh, roll call vote, please. Mayor Acuna. Aye. Councilmember Borelli? Aye. Vice Mayor Saragossa? Aye. Councilmember Taylor? Aye. Councilmember Thomas? Aye. Thank you. The balance of the uh, consent calendar is <coughs> approved. So now we will hear item 8.4, which was um, oh, yet uh, semi controversial issues uh, regarding the uh, Federal Communication, Communication Commission. Uh, 
Uh, I believe Mr. Rivas would have the staff report on this item. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Um, staff is asking the council to do two things. Uh, the first would be to adopt a resolution of intent to initiate amendments to the city's municipal code and create a section that would regulate um, the installation of small cell wireless facilities that are necessary to be consistent with the Federal Communications Commission final rule that was uh, recently adopted for wireless infrastructure deployment, which is in anticipation of uh, 5G technology. And then number two, that the council would consider authorizing the mayor to sign a letter in support of House of Representatives uh, Bill uh, 530, and that's called the Accelerating Wireless Broadband Development by Empowering Local Communities Act of uh, 2019. Uh, that was brought to our attention by the uh, League of California Cities. Essentially, uh, what this ruling is doing, and, and addresses a number of different things, and I if you look at your staff report, I have some bulleted, more specific items uh, that the FCC ruling uh, was addressing. One would have, would have been rule violations. So in other words, uh, does a local agency have regulations that sort of be a preemption of allowing for the installation of these small um, cell devices? Um, two, uh, fees and charges. So the Federal Communication Commission had a list of maximum fees that the city could potentially charge for applicants that come in and want to locate uh, small cell in infrastructure within the city. And I just want to note too that um, it basically would require that the city would entertain and allow for the installation of these small facilities within city right-of-way. So we're talking about uh, light poles, uh, utility poles, and the like uh, where these items could be located. And so a major concern, at least in the city of Placeville, would be the decorative lights that we have on, on Main Street. And so again, that's why we'd like to get an ordinance in place that will address those issues. Um, another uh, item that they addressed was non-fee requirements. And basically what, what non-fee provisions in the local regulation uh, mainly regarding aesthetics and undergrounding, minimum spacing, and those types of uh, requirements uh, that could operate that would be a prohibition on the service. So again, uh, we want to regulate how these are located, what they're going to look like, but the regulations couldn't be so oner onerous that they wouldn't be able to um, uh, locate within the city and provide service. Another item is what's called shot clocks, and essentially shot clocks are just timelines so when a provider, be it AT&T or Verizon, they submit an application to the city, we would then be under um, a time constraint in terms of processing that application. And then grandfathering, uh, that was the last one that we listed and basically it, uh, how that would affect previous agreements between a, a municipality and a carrier and the city currently has none. Well, the city has currently been approached by AT&T to enter into an agreement and in order to do that, staff feels it would be advantageous to actually have an ordinance in place uh, that they would be have to be compliant with even before we would consider an agreement with the carrier. And essentially, that would be a way for the carrier to make an application and maybe be a more expedited process uh, because essentially they could just show that they're um, in compliance with our code, in compliance with the agreement, and therefore then they would be allowed to locate within a utility pole or some other facility within the city right away. And so um, uh, one thing I didn't want to forget to mention, and, and, and my apologies for this minor clerical error, throughout the staff report and the resolution that's before you, the actual file number is uh, ROI 1902, not 1901. 1901 is the file number for the 8.5. So uh, with that, I'll be happy to answer any questions you have. We are hoping you will consider authorizing the mayor to sign that letter in support of HR 530, which would essentially uh, state that uh, the Federal Communications Declar Declaratory Ruling and Third Report in Order uh, shall have no force or effect. Thank you, Mr. Rivas, for the uh, comprehensive report. Are there any questions from the Council for uh, Pierre at this point? 
Peter, what type of timeline are we looking at for, for this? Um, I, I, I know you mentioned at and has already approached us. Are, are we getting multiple, like, for the Verizons and other folks starting um, to knock on our doors for, for this? We have actually been working with at and T now for several months, but um, just I've recently been contacted by Verizon, and I hope to meet with their representative probably within the next week. So if I understand this correctly, any number of companies can come in and we buy, they by right have the opportunity to place their devices on our polls and is there a limit to the number of devices on the number of polls? That's one of the things we want to look at um, and that would be the aesthetics component and I think um, in, in my read the city has until April in order to address aesthetics Could where the rest of the order has been in effect uh, since January okay uh, there there uh, my research I don't know how it's fairly accurate the, there is a small town in New York that is actually uh, in in a lawsuit with one of the telephone with one of the companies to uh, on the whole aesthetics and fighting them on that and I'm not sure what the re where that's going or how long that'll take but uh, it's definitely in the works right now um, another thing uh, how soon do we have I mean do we have a shot clock on how soon this has to be done because there's it seems like we should be able to limit we should have and they don't even have the technology specs out yet is that correct on 5g they just want to put a box on our poles at this point that's correct. I don't. I'm not knowledgeable enough to actually mm -hmm. speak to the technology itself. But I know that there's a, a race, from what I understand, out there in order to get 5G out and running, and mm -hmm. I think that's international. Yeah, and at some point, if, if we actually install fiber on our that the city owns, we could have our own 5G network up here, which we could then lease to them. Is there? I mean, it would seem like it would be. Um, I, I did talk to our guys that were that we're talking to about fiber earlier today and they said that that is an actual opportunity to do that if if we get that ball rolling quick enough and uh, so is there positions and spaces on there that we could reserve for ourselves as opposed to giving those up to AT&T or where they're put on the pole and such I it is all I know it's all up in the air but uh, I think you know that we would want to be conscious of that as well Yes, that's something we'll probably be looking at all those different options. At this point, we're just trying to get your authorization to begin the process to amend the code and okay. research all the different aspects of this dilemma. All right, thank you. And we'll see if another bill comes out of Sacramento as well that you know failed last year, but mm -hmm. I would assume something will be back again. Uh, Councilmember Borelli, did you have any questions at this time? I, I, I know that there's quite a bit of opposition from what I've been reading um, that's coming across the internet and, and I see in the paper to the G5. Uh, are the public, are, are they going to be given any kind of opportunity to oppose this or um, should that be addressed in what we're talking about? That well, this is a discretionary process. In other words, we're looking at amending the zoning code. So we'll have public hearings before the Planning Commission and before the Council, mm -hmm. which will provide the public the opportunity to So well, I, I think what I, I, I okay, I am not understanding that if this, if this were, if they were to get, they were to get their way and pass this, would we have a, an opportunity? I mean, would that be possible if, if they passed it and said this is the way we're going to do it and you have to accept it? That's what I'm not understanding. I mean, let me jump in too. So, the the feds have already passed this law. It's in place now, saying that we have to allow them to place their small cells on our. Okay, on I our thought polls. that's what you told me. That's correct. Okay. The bill that is proposed here would reverse that action, and, okay. and and so that's what we're asking you to consider authorizing the mayor to sign that letter to reverse that action. Technically, if they come to us tomorrow and say we want to, they can file application with us. I believe the date is 60 days. We're trying to find days. that right now. We have 60 days to apply to reply to that. 
we're working with them right now. We're hoping, and, and I, I believe the Verizon representative understands that we would like to adopt this ordinance to regulate to the extent that we can. We're hoping that they will work with us on that and not file those applications until we have the opportunity to get that in place, and that's possible. So as far as the timeline, it, it's, it's urgent that we move forward as quickly as we can with this if we want to be able to regulate it at all. Because who knows whether or not what's going to happen with the the bill that's uh, in in the federal with the federal government. So, and Mr. Mayor, if I may, also uh, that the ordinance would set we would actually set fees, and we would also be able to, at some extent, uh, lease the our our property, if you will, within within our right of way. And we don't we just don't have the mechanisms for that in place yet, which we need. Thank you for that, Mr. Rivas. Uh, Councilmember Taylor, did you have any questions at this point? Um, well, just to make sure that I'm understanding it correctly, because there was a lot to unpack here. Um, whether or not HR 530 passes, we do want to stay, um, you know, with the times in terms of technology and set ourselves up so that 5G can come here. But we want to amend the zoning so that we have control of how that's going to happen. Am I? Yes, you're exactly right. In fact, you made a really good point. I think uh, the city does not want to roadblock this new technology, mm -hmm. the 5G. We just want to be able to regulate it. And our main concern was our decorative uh, light, light poles and fixtures. And so we want to be able to assess appropriate fees to process the applications. We want to be able to uh, provide um, an appropriate level of, of lease so that the city can get some revenues, but it's not, it can't be onerous so that it's actually stopping at technology. Because currently in our code, we don't regulate it. It's, mm -hmm. it's silent on these small cell facilities. OK, thank you. Welcome. Thank you for all those good questions. Pierre, I have one, and it's uh, kind of the shot clock, um, I guess. What is your expectation from your staff to uh, getting this to the pl uh, Planning Commission for their first, first hearing on these, this new ordinance? You mean how soon we're going to get it to the Planning yep. Commission? Probably not until March. I would say probably the second meeting in March. Okay. And then um, how long do you anticipate before it would come to the council? Uh, probably then by April. Okay. And then, because the, so the industry is actually poised to kind of do what they want right now with the way the federal regulations are written? That's right. Okay. So time is of very... Time is of the essence. Of the essence. Okay. And um, in the course of your work to develop this new reg these new regulations, you would be addressing the impact to our historic district or our historic structures, et cetera, in protecting them? That would be the aesthetic considerations, okay. yes. So just to give a horrible example, the way the federal law is currently written, could a cell carrier come in and want to uh, locate on top of the bell tower? <laughs> Good question. I don't know. Okay. Potentially, they could. Okay. Wow. Thank you, Mr. Uh, the city attorney was up here uh, kind of answering that one. So thank you. Um, I want to thank uh, Vice Mayor Saragossa for pulling this. This actually probably should have been a discussion item, and I'll take the blame for not recognizing that when we uh, did the draft agenda uh, last week. This, this definitely needs to be um, heard by the public, um, especially um, – the, the potential impacts to a historic town like ours in regards to the aesthetics issue. And the other thing, whenever we ask for the mayor or the council to send out letters of support on issues, I think it's really important that the public uh, has an opportunity to uh, address this council and say whether or not they, uh, you know, they, you know, what their thoughts are on that particular recommendation. Um, this one, I think, is, is pretty clear cut, but still, it doesn't matter. Um, so, again, uh, I, uh, my fault, this should have been something, another one of our discussion items. But uh, so I appreciate having pulled. Um, I will ask if there's any member of the public that would like to address the council on item 8.4, which is the um, urgent need to adopt resolution, or excuse me, regulations on the uh, small cell site installations. Anyone like to approach? The podium, please state your name for the record. I support the general idea that you had about updating the, uh, the code locally. Uh, these are some of the questions I have. Uh, in this county, we have a big concern about expanding 
reception for wireless communication. Uh, so the question is, what has been done to coordinate the, with the county's position? What are they doing? Uh, what's being done to coordinate with local communications companies in the same business instead of the big giants like AT&T and Verizon? I think CalNet, for example, I understood had a, uh, a, a grant that they worked on with the counties where they could expand using uh, an expanded 4G technology. Uh, how does that work? Uh, you know, how would that affect it? And again, just like last year, you're in a reactive state. Last year, the League of California, the League of Cities was asking you to take a position against a bill that would limit local control. Here you're doing something along the same lines for the same purpose. But proactively, uh, what can be done to expand uh, local reception? For example, Mr. Thomas raised the idea of the city having its own 5G network. H how does that work? Could you do that? What is CalNet's program? Like most of us, when I want to know about these things, I even have to hire a technician or a 12-year-old to program my phone. <laughs> and, and I know you, so I, I don't really know the difference in those systems, but I think it would be important to know so we can expand it. Um, again, we desperately need to expand service in this area uh, because of our rural geographical nature and how the population is spread out. And imagine things when it comes to forest fires up in paradise. They had a problem with reception. Um, <coughs> so it'd be good to be proactive and to involve the county, if that hasn't been done, and, and likewise local communication companies to see what other options are out there besides 5G. The last is that if I was investing in stock, up to a, a couple weeks ago, I would have gone for AT&T and Verizon because of 5G. But last week in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, they covered articles about while well, the United States has been in, in, in a cyber war of sorts, a political war with China, because their big Chinese company is in competition with Samsung. And the point is, whoever has the 5G technology would be able to control communications throughout the world. You can, if you have control that system, get into any communications anywhere around. Um, and, and that changes things, because look what happened to the stock for Apple when they had some hacking done. First time they've had a stock decline since they've been in existence, and that was after their, their system was hacked. So I'm not sure it's going to be the big thing in the future necessarily. Thank you, Mr. Smith, and I believe staff was noting your concerns, and they are uh, very valid points. Is there any other member of the public wishing to address us on this item? Um, I think uh, Councilmember Taylor said it well, that we need to uh, be prepared to have 5G. It's going to be the future. It will be an expected service here. And the thing we need to do is make sure that it doesn't clash with the community values. So I appreciate staffs recognizing that we do need to get, uh, get back out ahead of this again. Uh, would someone like, if there's no further discussion, would someone like to make a motion on the item that's before us? I'll make a motion to adopt uh, the resolution and to authorize our mayor to sign a letter of support of HR 530. I'll second that. <coughs> that was seconded by Councilmember Borelli? No. Councilmember yeah. Taylor. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much and thank you for your input from the audience. <coughs> Pierre, we wish you great luck and, and speed mm. to uh, stay try and stay equal with the uh, 5G network community. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Not an easy task. All right, moving on to item, uh, let's see, we have no ordinances or public hearings this evening, which will bring us to the discussion and action items. And we had earlier moved item 12.8 <clears throat> to be heard before the other items. And who has the staff report for item 12.8 this evening? Good evening again, Mr. Lishman. Yes, thank you, Mayor Kuna and members of the council. And thank you, Ms. Rodman, for the gold star tonight. Appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, tonight, we're asking council to adopt a resolution approving new participant fees as shown in attachment B and program schedule as shown in attachment C for the Placerville Aquatic Center effective April 1st of 2019. 
and approving the purchase of an inflatable obstacle course from AFLEX Technology for the Aquatic Center for a not to exceed amount of $10,500 and approving a $10,500 budget appropriation from the general fund, unassigned fund balance for the said purchase and authorizing the interim director of community services to negotiate a memorandum of understanding with Marshall Medical Center and the amount of $10,500 for the said purchase and authorizing the interim director to execute the same. Staff has conducted its annual review of all programs at the Plasterville Aquatic Center, including program attendance trends, participant feedback, and revenue expenditure data. We also considered the mandated increase in minimum wage that went into effect of January 1st this year. To summarize our recommendations, staff is recommending an operating season of May 25th through September 2nd, which is Memorial Day through Labor Day. We're also proposing some small schedule changes that we believe will improve attendance and streamline operations. The biggest recommended change in the schedule is a reduction in evening public swim hours. Evening public swim operates at a deficit of estimated to be $7,100 per season. Staff recommends reducing this program from five nights a week to three nights a week on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. There would be an emphasis on Friday evenings as a family fun night. It would include a rotating list of activities, including the inflatable obstacle course, which I'll get to in a minute, and uh, movie nights. Staff recommends offering two movie nights over the course of the summer. Staff also recommends shifting afternoon public swim times 15 minutes and evening public swim times by 30 minutes. This will allow staff to adjust swim lesson times to correlate with some attendance trends we're seeing. In an effort to be a community hub, staff recommends opening time slots to the Placerville Union School District for class parties the week of May 28th through May 31st, something we haven't done in, in quite a long time. Many of our local schools are commuting to the Cameron Park CSD pool for their class parties. These time slots will be on a first come first serve basis with the availability to reserve starting on March 4th at 9 a.m. This program will offer the facility to the local schools at the price of $4.16 per student, which is the same rate that the Illinois County Office of Education Extended Day Program uh, currently pays. All other changes to the program schedule, such as rentals, lap swim, water exercise, will be to align with the new public swim and swim lesson times. In addition to the program changes, staff is recommending the purchase of an inflatable obstacle course similar to the one shown in your attachment F. Over the last several years, the number of aquatics facilities offering inflatable obstacle courses has increased. In an effort to be relevant and engage in our community's needs, staff recommends the purchase of an inflatable obstacle course for the Placerville Aquatic Center. Staff was successful in securing a local sponsorship with Marshall Medical Center to assist with the purchase of an inflatable obstacle course. Marshall Medical Center has proposed a five-year partnership. This partnership includes a $10,500 donation to the Placerville Aquatic Center to promote health and exercise through an obstacle course. The donation will be paid out over a five-year period in payments of $2,100 a year due April 1st. Staff proposes the purchase of a large inflatable obstacle course to be used during public swim on Tuesdays and Thursday afternoons, Saturdays and Sundays, as well as evening swim on Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So essentially it, it will be used uh, seven days a week. To boost participation, staff will look to implement the use of the inflatable in other areas when appropriate. Inflatables have become increasingly popular at aquatics facilities in recent years. And initial market data indicates that most facilities experience an increase in attendance and revenue. The Folsom Aquatic Center has seen an additional $27,000 to $45,000 in revenue per year from wristband sales alone for their inflatable obstacle course since they introduced it in 2009. Attached uh, is a case study, attachment E, that was completed by the Folsom Aquatic Center from 2015 showing the increases in the revenue since the purchase of their inflatable obstacle course. The inflatable obstacle course will be used to increase revenue and attendance during public swim, evening swim, facility rentals. During these periods, there will be an additional fee for any person wishing, wishing to utilize the obstacle course. This purchase and implementation has the potential to keep the facility from having to continually raise fees to cover personnel costs. With that, I would also like to thank Aquatic Supervisor Chris Lombardi, who's here in the audience for all her hard work on, on helping make this uh, possible. And at this time, this concludes staff's oral presentation, and I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank, Thank you, you, Matt. Uh, are there questions for uh, Mr. Glishman at this point on this item? I've got a couple questions. Well, certainly. First of all, I'm so excited about movie night. I'm, I will be there, me and my daughter. 
Um, I was just curious about the difference between facility and party rentals. And I actually have a couple more questions. And why you think evening swim has decreased over the last couple of years, if there's any theories kicking around, and also what the age limit for the obstacle course is going to be. Okay, so uh, the facility versus party rent rentals, I'll, I'll answer that one first. Facility rentals are when somebody comes in and rents the pool to themselves as a private facility rental. So they're the only ones potentially in that particular okay. pool. A party rental is a basically like a party package where they rent a table and canopy area um, and they're guaranteed, uh, is it tw 20? 20, 20 uh, swimmers and it's during the rec swim hours. Okay. So they, it's not a private party, but they have their own kind of dedicated uh, table area. And then um, I'd like to call, uh, ask, invite Krista to come up to the podium since she came all the way out here tonight to uh, share um, the thoughts behind the evening swim decreasing. So thank you, thank you, Krista. Hi. Um, Good evening. If you could introduce yourself for the yeah, audience. Krista Lombardi. I am the aquatic supervisor for Parks and Recreation. Um, the first thing I did when looking at our budget was I tried to figure out what's broken. Um, and the person who was in the position before me, Kim, was my supervisor for a long time. And I immediately said, what's going on with Evening Swim? And she said, you know, it's been a hard thing for many years. And we've tried lots of things. We've incorporated game nights. We've had spirit nights. Um, the, the honest answer is we can't tell you. Um, it's one of the programs that we've consistently seen a decline in with our pass holders and our drop-in and I can't figure out what it is. So this is my attempt at revamping the program to make it successful and to, you know, pull in that community hub. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Appreciate that extra information. Uh, Did and you then have the, any the age limit on the oh. obstacle course. <laughs> what the age? Do you remember the age limit? <laughs> What's the age limit? So the question is the age limit on the the obstacle course. Obstacle mm -hmm. course. So okay. currently, Folsom does not. Im there's no legal age limit that's applied. Um, it is recommended that any kids, they have to be comfortable in the water. They have to be able to walk on their own and be able to maneuver through the obstacle courses obstacles on their own. Um, so as of right now, there's technically no age limit. Anybody on it is allowed to wear a life vest or is supposed to wear a life vest. And so Folsom doesn't require a certain age and I wouldn't assume that we would either unless that was something that we felt like we needed to do. I would love to have it open to any kid who could do it. Does it require um, any extra lifeguards? With it does not. That's one of the beautiful things about it too. Because of the way that we set up our facility with our um, lifeguards, we are very careful to make sure all areas of our pool are covered with and without an inflatable in the pool, so this doesn't require any additional staff. Great, thank you. Yeah. All right. Very good, thank you. Any other questions? All right, I'll go ahead and open this item up for public comment. Is there anyone uh, wishing to address the council on item 12.8, our <coughs> annual aquatic center operations fees and the obstacle course? Uh, Kirk Smith. Good evening, Ian. I don't know if I'm going to be any more successful in raising this issue now than I have been in the past. It's that we should be seeking compensation from the county because the county is a recipient of this kind of service. Uh, it's 11,000 now. A few years ago, to expand hours, it was 40 or 50,000. It stacks up. And when I've raised this before, like paving over at the county, in front of the county museum or paving in front of the the county fairgrounds the answer is well people in the city also use county roads but it's not proportional i don't know the last time any of you were up in grizzly flats but for me it's been decades or over in georgetown a long time ago but every day those people come down like on pleasant valley road bumper to bumper and they come into the city so it's not it's not the same uh, those are a county function is to have that service, though so it's called a city pool. The county museum serves people throughout the county. The county fairgrounds serves people throughout the county. This is the county seat. 
So if the two by two committee is to interface with the county, I'm just asking you be advocates for us and seek that kind of money because they should be paying for it to appear for our roads uh, that they benefit from and paying for services for recreational things, great services that they benefit from. That's just a suggestion. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Any other member of the public wish to address the council on this item? Seeing no one approaching the podium, I'll close the public comment and bring it back to the council for action. It is a pleasure of the council. It's not quite a Yule log, <laughs> which was something Steve Yule wanted. It was a log roll, and uh, it looked quite fun, but it just didn't happen during his era, and he's home retired now, so we move on. And I appreciate the staff finding another attraction for the pool because um, it obviously, uh, you, you know, we do need to be creative. We need to need to be thinking ahead and trying to increase the folks who want to come and visit it. I would ask the city manager to address the annual uh, contribution that we receive from El Dorado County. Yeah, we have currently negotiated. We did a, a small amount, but we do receive twenty thousand dollars a year towards our aquatic center from the county. And um, well, maybe Mr. Warren or Mr. Morris could, ex else on the opposite side, what is the annual operating deficit for the aquatic center? I don't have the exact number, but it's just slightly north of two hundred thousand dollars deficit that we subsidize. So the general Our fund subsidy subsidizes too. the pool operation in total. It's approximately two hundred thousand dollars. Okay, that was that's more than I had realized. So I'm glad I asked that question. I'm glad you did too. Is there any other uh, any other comments or questions for staff on this item? So, no. I thought maybe are 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 we working with maybe negotiating for more money from the county? I thought that was something that we had talked about. I know this is just an ongoing thing, but um, if you would like, we could bring it up again at our next uh, two on two meeting. Um, we have attempted to, we proposed higher amounts, but they have, we have not been successful at this point. So we ask and they tell us no. Correct. But we'll ask again. <laughs> okay. Because now we, will, we, we will bring it up. Yeah. I think it's reasonable. Yeah. We have an inflatable. That's just awesome now. Uh, or we will have. Well, we've also we, just heard from Dave Warren, 200,000. Yeah. <laughs> That's a lot. Has that, what is, what is the, um, history of that has it been in that two hundred thousand dollar range or is that is that number going or am i digging too deep here for your memory i don't have a real extensive analysis of that we could look at it um, i can tell you that what the fees cover is the direct cost mm -hmm. and that's been our past practice um, uh, in recommending to the council the fees so what we mean by direct cost is the uh, labor supplies and services that directly uh, provide for the program it doesn't include overhead for example uh, community services administration uh, personnel it doesn't include propane electricity um, you know chemicals for the it's just the, the actual program of providing the, the program services themselves All right, thank you well, that's where I'm coming from, is that we have been at receiving $20,000 a year for a, a number of years, and our costs have risen. So maybe if we, uh, you know, get the figures and present it, you guys could, at the two-by-two, two, that we could at least start some conversation. So everybody's costs are going up. Mm -hmm. yep. All right. What's well, the pleasure of the council on this item? Do I have a motion? I'd move that we... Uh, uh, move this uh, resolution. I don't have a number. What is it? 12.8. .8. I'll, I'll second that and just want to make a quick comment. I uh, really want to thank staff for all the work they put into this. It's a really thorough uh, report and um, it's all of, uh, on all on each item. So I thank you for that. We appreciate it and for looking for new ways to use it. And you know the movie right. nights definitely. I'll, I'll take part in that as well. So uh, I'm looking forward to. Uh, to that thank you thank you all right uh, uh, would the clerk please call a roll there's been a motion to approve yes mayor Acuna aye councilmember Raleigh aye vice mayor Saragossa aye councilmember Taylor aye councilmember Thomas aye thank you motion to approve congratulations and thank you very much for all your hard work we will we will be at, when will the inflatable be ordered 
as soon as we can negotiate an MOU with Marshall Medical Center, uh, it, shouldn't, it shouldn't be too long. Very good. Thank you. We're looking forward to it. And we don't want to find the police officers out there using as an obstacle training, huh? In the pool, we get a little water training, you know, obstacles, <laughs> canine maybe. <laughs> Gotta look for opportunities to the use all of our resources. Might, the clause might have, uh, provide, they might be a problem. <laughs> all right. Back to our regular uh, order of the agenda, item 12.1. Adopt a resolution. Well, I, I should state before we begin this that this is a whole bunch of happy 12 points. Um, these are some facilities that I didn't think would ever see the light of day. So uh, the first one is 12.1 Adopt a resolution approving uh, an agreement with Doug Gurkamp Engineering for repair work and striping at the Fox parking lot. Uh, City Engineer Neves, Acting Public Works Director, Stone. the Mountain Democrats leaving. Darn. Uh, Nick Stone. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening, Mayor. Council, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Thanks. Happy to be here. Um, We're happy to have you. Tonight, I'm asking you to adopt a resolution approving a construction service contract with Doug Beer Camp General Engineering for patch paving, seal coating, and striping of the Fox parking lot in the amount of $10,324. Um, the Fox parking lot's the, one of the first parking lots you hit if you're coming from the west side of town. It's uh, Main Street, right next to the El Dorado Savings Building uh, Bank. The purpose of this proposed contract is to replace failed sections of asphalt, extend the life of remaining asphalt in the Fox parking lot by seal coating it. Sections of asphalt located in the Fox park parking lot are failing and remaining asphalt needs maintenance to prevent it from failing. Staff met with local paving contractors in November of 2018 to discuss solutions for repairing the failed asphalt and to discuss solutions for extending the life of asphalt that is still salvageable. Um, after a meeting with multiple contractors, the lowest bid received was from Doug Beercamp, General Engineering, uh, for $10,324, and that was followed by a combined bid from Wilson's Asphalt, Joe Vecini, Incorporated. Uh, their bid was $10,796. Scope of work includes saw cutting and removal, replacement of 35 square feet of asphalt, cleaning approximately 20,160 square feet of asphalt, and uh, fog sealing it, restriping it. Uh, the work is scheduled to begin once weather conditions permit, and once the start date is confirmed, public notification and outreach will commence. 10% contingency of $1,032 is recommended if additional items are needed during construction and to further address field conditions and repairs to the existing facilities. Staff's recommendation also includes a regret request to grant the city manager the authority to approve any foreseen change orders during construction to address items beyond the awarded contract scope of work and prevent project delay. With council approval, the city manager will be able to negotiate any necessary contract change orders being requested for a not to exceed amount of $1,032. Uh, the process for using this proposed authority will be upon evaluation in the field during construction. Uh, myself will review force count options and make, or make, re make a recommendation to the city manager to address the, the out of scope work that would deliver a more complete and durable project for the Fox parking lot. And if staff, if time allows, staff will present any change orders to the city council for approval prior to execution. Uh, are there any questions? Thank you, Mr. Stone. Any questions for interim public works director? I do. <clears throat> I do have a couple. Um, is it possible, uh, based on your description of the scope of work, the brick on the the tree planters, you know, several of the bricks have been removed or knocked off or backed into, and it <clears throat> it's a bit of an eyesore. Is that is that a possibility? That's that's one question. The, another question is on the what would it be the the northwest corner of the parking lot closest to the creek and Jack Russell Brewery. That is a place where drainage the leaves back up against the fence. It creates flooding that actually during heavy rains jack russell brewery actually sandbags their doors just to be cautious because they've had it actually flood into their space there it is um the fence gets all clogged up and with the leaves and debris and the, the water piles up in that corner so it's a it's definitely a challenge for jack russell brewery and the third thing is, is and this is probably a, a reach a little too far but the trees uh, seem to be seem to be 
taken apart the planters in those in those park in those that are in there and i i don't know if you've evaluated that if it's the trees or people running into it or what but there's some you know if we're going to make the parking lot pretty we're going to have some eyesores of planters in there if we don't uh, consider replacing some of the bricks on uh yes sir so in regards to the the other work that you're talking about when the initial project was approved it included um there's a part of that chain link fence that butts up to the El Dorado savings building mm -hmm. that's been cut multiple times yeah. um that was one of the items that, that our public work staff was going to take care of because it'd probably be more cost effective than having a contractor do it mm -hmm. um in regards to the drainage issue one of the items that we went over when we met out on site with the contractor was um it would be towards the south side of that parking lot there's a drain that's the, the grades incorrect with it mm -hmm. and i think that when they correct that item it'll it'll help with that north northwest corner that you're talking about and that's also an item so both those things will be corrected as far as the the trees pushing out on the planters mm -hmm. i haven't looked at that but that's something that we can definitely investigate and then uh, correct as needed all right and one one more question where's what is the funding source for this this is coming from our our park uh, parking fees mm -hmm. so for uh, the lease parking general uh, general daily parking and and citations so all right thank you parking paying for parking lots uh, any other questions uh, from the council at this point thank you Nick doing a great job is there any comment from the members of the public on item 12.1 Sue Rodman, a drafted person on the public uh, on the parking committee, and I am really happy to see some of that money actually going to be used to fix the parking lots, which is one of the reasons that we recommended the things we did from the parking committee to raise the fees so that we could take care of our parking lots. So I think this is wonderful, and I'll give you. This would be my same comments for item 12.2, so I'll only bother you once to say yay for the parking committee and yay for the funds that have been raised to do this work. And thank you, Nick, for uh, pushing this on in to get it done. All right, thank you, Sue. And we'll note that there's a ditto on 12.2, so you don't... We can save it. Is there any other comments from the public on this? I'll bring it back to the council for action. Um, I would just like to comment, um, you know, uh, Mr. Stone mentioned it. it is one of the first lots that you see, and it is one of the lots that I uh, go into on the weekends when we are being visited by throngs and thousands of folks, and the current condition of it is a real embarrassment. Um, and so for um, the staff and Camp Engineering to come up with this repair uh, on a very heavily used and very visible to our visitors uh, and our tourist dollars um, I think this is just outstanding um, and again you in the striping oh goodness it'll be so nice to know if I'm actually parked in a spot and I'm not going to get it over the line uh, because right now it's anybody's guess so um, thank you very much these I I told Cleve earlier today as, as I mentioned earlier I didn't think we'd ever be able to afford to get this fixed because it again really it is setting a, a it is not putting us uh, our best foot forward when people are stumbling around in the parking lot and they can't and they can't figure out where to park their cars and so on and so forth so uh, if there's any other comments or if there's a motion to approve this item I'd like to move we adopt the resolution is there a second second moved by councilmember Borelli seconded by councilmember Thomas uh, roll call vote please Mayor Acuna aye councilmember Borelli aye vice mayor Saragossa aye Councilmember Taylor? Aye. Councilmember Thomas? Aye. Motion carries unanimously. We move on to <coughs> item 12.2, another parking lot um, repair project. And this is the T Troll lot. Mr. Stone. Thank you, Mayor. Yes, uh, this project is very similar to the one that we just went over at the Fox lot. Um, tonight we're asking for approval of a construction service contract with Doug Beer Camp General Engineering. In the amount of twenty-one thousand eight hundred and forty-nine dollars, um, the scope of this project is a little bit bigger. If you notice in the back corner, 
of the tea trout lot. It would be the northeast corner. It, uh, when it rains, it develops quite a puddle back there, and that, that's one of the major failed sections of asphalt. Um, this project will include the removal of that, the regrading so that it flows properly out towards the street, um, but it also includes the, the removal and replacement of asphalt. Uh, 776 square feet, cleaning, seal coating and striping of 19,090 square feet, and a 10% con contingency, excuse me, um, in the amount of $2,184. All right, any questions? Oh, thank you. Uh, any questions for staff? Councilmember Taylor, she probably uses this lot a lot. I, I had one, and uh, Cleve's been seeing this one coming for a long time. Um, we have what I consider to be the most despicable, uh, highly used pothole out there in the parking lot, uh, post office shared driveway. And you can actually see it from space because on the, on the larger map <laughs> presented here, um, I can see all the dark spots. And Beer Camp is gonna be literally feet away from that. Every postal customer uses goes through that hole. Mm -hmm. Most of the hotel guests go through that hole. Many of our downtown merchants go through that. The city manager goes through that hole. I think he's got a neck injury because he's not noticing this hole. Now, yes, it's outside the parking lot, and yes, we do have to keep these projects reined in because we have an ample uh, opportunity to repave streets in this road, in this town. But to not fix that entrance uh, as an addition to what has been proposed here by Mr. Veerkamp, I think would be an absolute disgrace of having a fully capable construction company staged, materials being delivered that desperately need to go in this this 20 by 20 foot hole or whatever it winds up being. So um, is there any thoughts on the possibility of to uh, do a change order? The council would support my concerns on this, uh, getting this particular, it's a series of holes really. Which, where are you talking about? Right here. Oh, I see. As you drive into As you go into the, the parking lot slash post office. Um, but, just quick, let, let us take a look at that. We'll get an estimate on what it'll take to, to do that. Um, it is a joint entrance between us and the post office. I doubt we would be successful in getting the post office to, I don't know how long it would take anyway, to agree to help us with that. So let us get an estimate on if it was within the change order amount that may be something that we can just do. If not, we'll look at maybe coming back to the council with a with a cost to, to do that so I mean the material that we grind out of the lot would be better out in the street than what the street is right now so I mean and this is not a knock on staff this is just how bad these things are so I appreciate the constructive thoughts on this yes um, is there any member of the public wishes to address the council on this and so you said you weren't going to get up for 12.2 <laughs> Yeah, but oh, I here I am your... because I agree with you that I thought that those potholes where you go into the parking lot and then swing up to the post office were part of this project and were going to be fixed. Mm. And if they're not, I'm really disappointed and I hope we amend this and get those fixed because they are terrible. <coughs> I mean, both of these parking lots really need help, but this one with the entrance to it, I mean, it's the entrance to the parking lot as well as to the post office. So it's part of the parking lot, and I thought that this would include fixing that, and if it doesn't, um, we need to fix that so it is fixed. We'll go out there with a new saw and we'll start cutting the asphalt. Any other member of the public wish to address this item, 12.2? Seeing no one approaching the podium, I'll close the public comment, bring it back to the council for action. May I make a comment, yeah, please? Um, I, Cleve, um, do we have, um, what kind of an agreement do we have with the post office? I, I've been thinking about that a lot as I go over the oh, So you, you <laughs> have a whole I, I, I do, oh, and, yeah. and I also think that there, everything that, that represents that post office is abominable. Mm -hmm. it's, right. it's a mess. And I've, I, tonight, and I'm sorry that I'm bringing this up out oh, of, I, but I, I wish we could um, maybe approach them and do something, and maybe we've already tried, 
Um, but it, it's it's the place is filthy. It, there's always garbage, and they don't keep it clean. And the landscaping, I think they might do every once every two years, and it, it's just really, you know, it's a prominent place in town. Everybody goes to the post office, and I just really. Um, I'm requesting that maybe <laughs> we could put that on future agenda, but it just came to my mind when we're talking about this. Yeah. So, I, I don't know what the agreement is. I'm looking kind of at Pierre. He's my my historian on it, but I'm guessing I, in looking at that, I I believe that possibly that area what we're talking about is maybe possibly in the city, partially in the city right of way, and partially on probably post office property is my guess. Yeah. But I'm not positive without without checking the parcel maps on that to determine. I don't know if we have an agreement for an, an easement uh, to uh, an access easement to our parking lot. I, I just can't tell you. I don't know, Pierre, if you have any additional information. Uh, just a few comments. It It is my understanding that that's, uh, that property is owned by the U.S. Postal Service, and so it's not city property. Um, but I'm not 100% sure. Uh, but I do want to comment on the overall condition of the post office. Uh, staff receives a lot of complaints about the post office because we are because it's in the city, and we do have a we have a good rapport with the with the postmaster. So we've been working with her from time to time. Um, there were complaints on the landscaping, and you probably noticed in, in the more recent past they did considerable uh, work on their landscaping. They removed dead plants they put in bark and they did a few things uh, but one thing they have been saying is <clears throat> their facility has been inundated with transients and transients do inflict a lot of damage and vandalism on the post office in fact the post office used to be open all night long and they're no longer I believe they shut their doors at 6 30 or 7 o'clock because uh, there was a lot of damage being inflicted not only on the exterior of the facility but on the interior. So just for the defense of the post office, I just wanted to get that information out. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe I wanted to comment. I, I, I think uh, uh, Dave and Cleve can lament on how much the, how much heat, and Sue can, how much heat the city took for, for up in the fees for parking and for, and for actually even bringing up the word parking at a meeting. And, uh, and the downtown merchants uh, were not exactly thrilled with it. And it took a lot of fortitude of the, of the council at that time and the parking committee and even the downtown merchants to approve and to move this issue forward so we have the money to do this. Otherwise, this wouldn't be available here to do. And the goal was to set aside $400,000 over 10 years. And this is hopefully is just the beginning of it. And we're going to be doing more over the coming years to improve our parking in town so there you go and Sue was a big part of that thank you thank you councilmember Thomas and thank you mr. Ewes for that information on the post office I you know I share councilmember Borelli's concerns uh, for the condition of the post office again another high visibility spot you're down there watching all of our visitors come and go and never mind the local folks that have a PO box that are driving in and out of there every day through that uh, challenging series of potholes it's you know to use the word disgraceful that it's gotten that bad but I understand that um, I I don't understand why we can't um, gently help the post office a little bit to uh, be a better tenant down there yeah encourage uh, so maybe Cleve and I can get together and we'll meet with you and we'll see what we can do down there because it's again folks do come and visit and that's uh, not setting a very good example so is there a where were we with this did I get a motion on this item 12.2 move. Move move by councilmember Borelli a second taken by councilmember Taylor and that would we also be asking to direct staff to seek a, a, a alternate funds to address oh. the pothole I'll include that in my so that would be included in the motion uh, if there's no other discussion I'll ask for a roll call vote please Mayor Acuna? Aye. Councilmember Borelli? Aye. Vice Mayor Saragossa? Aye. Councilmember Taylor? Aye. Councilmember Thomas? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you and congratulations on another great project. Nick, moving on to item 12.3. Ah, now the city engineer is going to address this. Good evening. This is Neves, item 12.3. Uh, requesting some uh, some additional funding for the Western Possible Interchange Project Phase 2. Good evening, Mayor Thomas, Vice Mayor Zaragoza, and Council Members. 
The proposed, Mayor, the proposed item before you this evening approves accredited amendment number one to authorization nine as part of the Western Plasma Interchange Project construction project under Dawkins Engineering's contract. It also approves authorization 10 to Dawkins contract for the Western Plasma Interchange eastbound on-ramp phase 2.2 project. <clears throat> You may recall in January of 2018, staff submitted an application for local partnership program funds for the eastbound on-ramp as part of the Western Plasville Interchange, better known as Phase 2.2, and was selected to receive $1,070,000. This program is a competitive funding source of Senate Bill 1. As on August 28, 2018, Council approved a, con a contract for design level survey for Phase 2.2. Since that time, staff has been developing the milestone tasks to move the project forward. Amongst these tasks, tasks include the preparation of a supplement project, supplemental project report to address the revised phasing of the overall Western Plasville Interchanges project. In the interest of time and efficiency, staff felt it would be beneficial to initiate those tasks that directly support the preparation of the supplemental project report. Dockin Engineering to date has provided environmental and design services for the project and is currently under contract to do so. Currently, construction of Phase 2 project has been underway for some months now and due to the efficiency of the project team, it's been identified that a portion of the previously approved budget under Dawkins Authorization Number 9 could be freed up to cover the tasks needed to support the Phase 2.2 Supplemental Project Report. A credited deduction of $45,000 has been identified and that is what is proposed as the amendment number one to authorization nine for Dawkins contract. Authorization number 10 in the amount of 69,887 would cover the tasks needed to support the supplemental project report and it is, would bring the contract authorized, authorized total to $3,272,451, which is still within Dawkins approved contract amount. Staff's recommendations are summarized in the report before you this evening. If anybody has uh, any curious um, interest in what the project would be, we do have a project exhibit that's posted in Town Hall, just on this other side of the wall right here. And we do have a project exhibit. We do have um, the overall interchange project exhibit is posted in several locations in Town Hall. One directly behind me and one directly behind Finance Director, Assistant City Manager, Mr. Warren. Um, and that concludes my verbal report. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you, Rebecca. Appreciate that. Uh, is there any questions from the council at this point? Is hearing done? Is there any member of the public wishes to address item 12.3, the uh, continuing engineering work on the Western Posterville Interchange Phase 2? Seeing no one approaching the podium, I'll bring it back to City Council for action. I would just like to thank staff for the, I won't even never fold this. This is the that is the nicest map I've seen of the ramp. I now know where it actually goes. <laughs> Most excellent. And I know how far up the road the walls have to be. So I really do appreciate that. Is there, uh, if there's no question, is there a motion? I move 12.4. I would move 12.4. I'll second. Sec Item 12.3. Oh, I moved 12.3 already. Yes, 12.3. Sorry about that. That's right. Moved by Council Member. Thomas and seconded by Vice Mayor Sharon Gosa. Roll call vote, please. Mayor Acuna. Aye. Councilmember Borelli. Aye. Vice Mayor Saragosa. Aye. Councilmember Taylor. Aye. Councilmember Thomas. Aye. And just for clarification, um, Rebecca, and then as we move forward on this, uh, the anticipated construction on this project is. We have a milestone sh schedule that shows the project will be let out to bid in January of next year. January. Almost two years to the date from when phase two was actually let out to bid. Okay. And that would put the construction of the project right in the same kind of time frame alignment, which would be approximately February of 2020 for initial tree clearing. We will do a little bit more PR letting people know about the tree clearing <laughs> and uh, lessons learned moving forward. <laughs> and uh, the construction's anticipated to last about a year or so. All right, thank you. So, Absolutely. Uh, construction season 2020. All right, thank you very much for that. All right, moving on to item, now we'll move on to item 12.4. We know Councilmember Thomas is anxious for this one. Um, we are being asked to approve a construction contract with Joe Vicini, Inc. Uh, for, oh my goodness, this is a bad one too, Big Cut Road uh, Asphalt Rehabilitation Project. Mr. Stone, is that your report? Yes, sir. Very good, please go ahead. Thank you, Mayor. 
Um, tonight we're asking to approve a construction contract with Joe Vicini Inc. in the amount of $48,820 for the Big Cut Road Asphalt Rehabilitation Project. Uh, that's project number 41909. And also to authorize the city manager to execute the same and authorizing the city manager to negotiate any necessary contract change orders not to exceed the amount of $4,882. Um, purpose of this contract is to improve the PCI index of Big Cut Road. It's currently failed. I don't know if anybody's driven it lately, but it's uh, it's one of the worst. It is. It doesn't even deserve to be called a road anymore. Exactly. Uh, the scope of this project is going to go from the top at Part E, the intersection right up there by the fire hydrant, all the way down to where Beer Camp left off with the paving on the Party Water Main project, in, right in front of the uh, Public Works courtyard entrance. Uh, are there any questions about the project? All right, are there any questions on the Big Cut Pavement Rehabilitation Project? As uh, Mr. Stone indicated, this is one of the worst roads in the city. All right, no questions from the council. Are there any member of the public wishing to address this item, 12.4? Seeing no one approaching the podium, we'll bring it back to the council for action. Someone like to make a motion? So moved. Second. second. Uh, moved by council member Borelli and seconded by Vice Mayor Saragosa. Roll call vote, please. Mayor Acuna? Aye. Council member Borelli? Aye. <laughs> Excuse me, <laughs> Vice Mayor Saragosa? Aye. Councilmember Taylor? Aye. Councilmember Thomas? Aye. Thank don't, you. don't promote him before his time. <laughs> City engineer, maybe you have to mayor. All right, well, that's, you know, and the beauty of this is, is anyone would say, and I'm sure, you know, I can share the sentiment of the staff. We have um, just issued some contracts with both the Cine in engineering and uh, Doug Beer Camp Engineering. So we are keeping these projects local, getting, the, getting some very much needed repair work done so that's really nice moving on to item 12.5 adopt a resolution uh, regarding the potholing and crack stealing on country club drive mr. stone thank you mayor uh, it's another paving contract this one's going to be with Jovacini Inc in the amount of 40 forty four thousand four hundred eighty dollars um, for country club drive initially Several, several of the cracks that, that go across Country Club Drive, Public Works staff went out there, attempted to saw cut them, remove the asphalt and pave some of it. If you look at um, the second sheet, that's, that's where some of the costs for Tykert and NorCal equipment were. Public Works was required to rent a mini excavator just, just to make the work a little bit easier instead of using a backhoe to try and remove some of that. Um, we thought it'd be in our best interest to, to get together with another contractor to get a little bit more bang for a buck with this and uh, Joe Vicini was the, the one who got the contract um, it's for 60 horizontal cracks restriping the center line and the work is scheduled to the work the work is scheduled to start as soon as weather conditions permit once start date is confirmed public notification outreach will commence um, are there any questions council member questions for Nick well, you really brought it this First meeting, awesome. I do have a question. Yes, sir. You mentioned um, re redoing the center line striping. Yes, sir. Many, many years ago, the, uh, I'll make a long story short, would it be possible to shift the line uh, from sh on Sean Drive, between Sean Drive and Jeffrey on Country Club? There, many, many years ago, I, we, I, the neighborhood tried to get um, that center line shifted when they repaved Country Club. And basically, there's not enough room there for the, You have houses on the south side of Country Club that back up to Lions Park, and they are allowed to park in front of their homes. The lane width is generally inadequate to allow a parked vehicle and, a, and travel and use of the travel lane. On the north side of that section of Country Club Drive, all of those homes are, that's the rear yard of all the homes that are up in Parkview Estates. They have absolutely no access, no driveways, nothing. Um, it, my attempt many years ago was to have the center line shifted over, making the north side no parking, which it isn't anyway because it's not safe, and there are absolutely no 
accesses there to any of the homes. Are they going to have enough of that line removed that we could move it over when they're doing this? Or would we have to grind it? I, I, I believe the the amount that they're going to grind out is fairly small. I don't know if okay, never mind. The, the, the limits would include that. But I had to ask, though, because <laughs> this would have been the time. Because it's a headache. Uh, Councilman, or Rick, she, former Mayor Rivas, uh, uh, Pierre's department received a complaint uh, last year regarding a business operating along one of the homes <coughs> on, on this section of Country Club, and they had four or five cars parked out there every day, and they were uh, almost hit on wrecks uh, on a daily occurrence. Oh, I just I just thought I needed to ask, but you're right. You're not taking enough of the line up. Thank you, Nick. <laughs> yes, Mayor. Um, any public want to comment on this particular item? This is the completion of the Country Club Drive crack seal and uh, potholing. And some of those cracks go down to another continent. <laughs> <laughs> Before you, you cut me off on the on uh, 2.4. I'm sorry. So, Would you like to comment on 2.4? Yeah, 2.4 is Big Cut Road. I live on Big Cut Road. I think it definitely needs to be done. And so does this one. And I'm really glad to see that we're splitting our contracts between our two great contractors in this town so we can keep them both working for us so those are my comments on both of them is yes good good job and then same thing for two two point twelve point six is yes that's another one we need to do so yay for these contracts we're actually getting some stuff done i hope some of this is major l money we will ask that question thank you sue any other member of the public wish to comment on 12.5? Seeing no one else approaching the podium. Um, is the uh, is there some measure HL funding in this particular project? I believe this one is SB1 funding. Is that correct, Dave? Uh, the country club? Yes. There was an SB1 Ruben. sign up there's there. There's a sign up there that yeah, says your tax, pay or your yeah. tax dollars are And also there's a Measure L sign up there, too. Yeah, that's true. It may have, right. I believe it does have a little bit of Measure L in it yeah. also. Okay. Yeah. So SB1 and Measure L. All right. Is there a, if there are no other questions, is there a motion for the item? I'll move the resolution. Second. Moved by Vice Mayor Saragosa, seconded by Councilmember Morelli. Roll call vote, please. Mayor Acuna? Aye. Councilmember Borelli? Aye. Vice Mayor Saragosa? Aye. Councilmember Taylor? Aye. Councilmember Thomas? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you very much. And again, uh, Nick, thank you for your hard work on these. This is fun. 12.6, adopt an resolution approving Doug Veerkamp General Engineering um, for a, the upper airport road asphalt rehabilitation project thank you mr. mayor uh, this is another paving contract asking for approval of a construction contract with Doug beer camp general engineering in the amount of seventy seven thousand six hundred and seventy nine dollars and twenty three cents upper airport road uh, the limits of this project will go from the county line up towards the airport down to Goldman um, it's going to consist of a three-inch grind, replace the asphalt, and restrife it. We're also, uh, excuse me, we're also asking for a 10% contingency of $7,767. Um, any questions? Any questions for staff? I think, I think we're clear with the, uh, the, again, generous maps, very helpful. Just for clarity, these actually, these contractors are earning these bids. We're not necessarily giving them to them. I'm, I'm glad you said that. Yeah, because, you know, you know, there's there's discussion about we're giving these bids to these people, and they're earning them by, by bidding the lowest, and by, you know, being local it helps reduce their cost of, of delivery, but at the same time, they're, they're competitive, and they're earning these bids and providing a great service to our city at the same time, so. But it is nice that the two local yes. contractors were the low bidders. Right. No, there no questions. Is there any member of the public wishing to address this item? And two, we noted that you are in thumbs, double thumbs up for 12.6. Bring it back to the council for uh, a motion. I move 12.6. Second. We moved and seconded. Roll call vote, please. Mayor Acuna. Aye. Councilmember Borelli. Aye. 
Vice Mayor Saragossa? Aye. Council Member Taylor? Aye. Council Member Thomas? Uh, aye. Thank you. Motion carries. Um, I'd just like to make a quick comment on this an airport road. You know, a lot of people might say, well, what are we doing that it's steep, narrow, etc.? You know, it is an important access for uh, cars and trucks to get up to the airport. And the airport serves in various roles. Um, one of the most, a couple of the most important uh, medical evacuations via helicopter, and also, of course, firefighting opportunities. Uh, the last few years, we've been very blessed to have a very large contract firefighting helicopters stationed up there. And we need to be able to get in on, from both ends. And it is a city road, and it, it, it needs to be functional so that uh, these types of emergency situations, people are able to use it just like any other street. So thank you very much for doing this. Look forward to the next part. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. I believe at this point, under tw item 12.7, Council I'm, Member Thomas. I'm going to need to recuse myself on 12.7 as I have property within the proximity of this project, so I will step aside. All right, we will wait for you to leave the dais and step into the secret room. It's going to do a lot of talking to spend all this money. And I know, you know, Sue, your comment earlier about the different contractors, um, I, I knew what you meant. But I, th this has all gone through a um, the proper bidding process. And, um, you know, Sue has been an advocate for years on H&L and and all of the other work, and, and we share the sentiment, but they are the successful bidders, and the pro proper processes are being followed. All right, with Council Member Thomas out of the room, I'll go ahead and, and introduce item 12.7, which we're being asked to adopt a resolution approving the placement of a demand upon the current owner at 1351 Broadway. This is basically for a street frontage improvement agreement. Um, who has the staff report? The city engineer, Neves. Good evening again, Rebecca. Good evening, Mayor Cunha, Vice Mayor Saragoza, and council members. This proposed item before you seeks approval for the placement of demand requiring performance pursuant to a, the executed street frontage improvement agreement located at Broadway Plaza. Uh, the agreement is um, SF-272. This demand would be placed upon the current owner of the property located at 1351 for the construction of concrete curb, gutter, and sidewalks. In 1990, City Council approved the Street Frontage Improvement Agreement as required by City Code Section 8-9-3 as a condition of approval on the building and conditional use permits obtained at that time. City staff has long identified the need for construction of contiguous pedestrian facilities within the Broadway corridor in the interest of public safety. In 2015, staff submitted an application and approval of funding through the high, and received an approval of funding, through, excuse me, through the Highway Safety Improvement Program, HSIP, for the Broadway Sidewalks Project. This project will improve sidewalk connectivity within Broadway Corridor by creating a t continuous path of travel for pedestrians from Mosquito Road to Schnell School Road. Project exhibits have been provided within Town Hall. They're actually located just behind Chief Ortega over there. The exhibit on the left shows the overall layout of the project, and the exhibit on the right shows cross-sections of the proposed roadway. Council also has those items before you, one on each side of the page. The project, the city's project, has necessitated the immediate need to place the demand for this particular parcel at Broadway Plaza. Since the last time this item was before you on January 22nd for the Broadway Sidewalks project, the project has received NEPA approval and is now ready to commence with final design. In review of the project's scope, there is a potential that HSIP would fund the construction, not the design, of the street frontage improvement agreements as part of the Broadway Sidewalks project due to the efficiency of delivery of the project. And due to the economies of scale, it does make more sense to include those improvements as part of the city's project. Therefore, the demand request at this time is in the amount of $31,000 is to cover engineering design costs only. Should coverage of the construction costs be needed in the future, that demand will be brought to Council at a later date. The HSIP funding carries an aggressive delivery timeline. The milestone schedule for this project shows design being finalized May 2019, bidding in July or August of 2019, and construction starting in September of 2019, and concluding in November of this year. As these milestones approach, staff will be commencing with public outreach to the community, especially to the impacted parcels and businesses within the project limits. That concludes staff's report, and I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you, Rebecca. The 
Council have questions for our city engineer? Vice Mayor Zaragoza. A um, couple of questions. Um, in terms of the um, the cost, the uh, the eighty seven and then the thirty one thousand. Um, you mentioned so those the funding that we received um, would end. Normally, we would end up asking the app. This would be paid for by the actual um, owner of that property, correct? That is correct. And in this case, we're not asking them to fund this because not at this time. Um, having that property contain this curb gutter and sidewalk would actually be a, it's a vital connection piece within the Broadway sidewalks project the highway safety improvement program is one of the most unique federal funding sources and that they actually have money <laughs> so um, they uh, at this time they are deeming the construction of that would be project eligible Some of the similar situations that can relate to that, actually, um, one that comes to mind is the Blairs Lane Bridge project. You may recall the Escaton project actually brought forth um, the original proposal of the project and the conditions of approval were that the developer was to provide um, a, a new bridge to connect to their subdivision. And uh, at that time, we put a dollar cap amount of $1.2 million. The city moved forward in the best interest of the community, as we are in this instance as well, and applied for a highway bridge program uh, project approval, and we received it. And highway bridge program did, in fact, pay for 100% of the construction for the uh, Blairs Lane Bridge. So that's an example of it, too. When it comes to the best interest of the public and, and how the project could actually be delivered, um, it's sometimes more efficient if we just pull up the reins and, and take care of it um, delivery wise and funding wise okay because but yeah my only concern was creating some sort of precedent for sort of what I would say waiving these these fees understood when we have it for another location where we where we don't have these funds available okay. thank you absolutely any other questions for staff um, I guess I had one uh, Rebecca is this you're saying then that this agreement will still be in force. We're, we're asking for the engineering dollars now and the construction obligation for the 88,000, it would still be, uh, we could still call that in? Mm -hmm. We're reserving that right. If, if we don't get the grant. Go ahead. If I might, Thank Mr. You. Mayor, I think yes, sir. the wording of the demand has to be such that we're demanding the entire project, but at this time, because of the phase we're in, it would just be for the engineering costs. Now, if something else changes that construction cost later on, that's fine. Um, the way the ordinance reads, the demand is supposed to be put on the owner to construct the sidewalk. In this case, due to efficiencies of scale, either, uh, my understanding is they are deferring to us doing it as part of the overall project we're doing. It's going to save them some money if, uh, based on whatever they're going to have to pay. But the demand should be for the entire, with right now, only requiring the engineering costs. Okay. All right. Very good. Any new questions with that? After that, a little bit of information. Thank you, Mr. Driscoll. Uh, good evening. Is there a member of the public that wishes to address the council on item twelve point seven, Broadway sidewalks? Good evening. Um, I'm Anne McQuillan. I'm the broker for Team Commercial. We're the property managers for Broadway Plaza. And when we had met earlier with engineering, there was some discussion of the, one of the issues we have here is some of the best landscaping other than Hangtown Village Square on Broadway is in front of Broadway Plaza. We really don't want to see all of our trees and shrubs and everything cut down. There is enough space behind that to have the sidewalks behind the landscaping so we can maintain the, the beauty of the street and still get our sidewalks. Is that still the intent? Um, I'll get, go ahead and ask me the questions and then we'll yeah, get so an answer The question is that, still, is that still the intent or are we looking at cutting down a lot of trees? Okay. Um, and then uh, I think that's essentially our major concern 
is we work really hard to make that shopping center look good. We're putting a lot of money into it right now. We'd sure hate to see all that beautiful landscaping go away. All right. Thank you, Ann. Appreciate your comments. Appreciate you sitting through it, watching us spend money to fix roads. Um, any other member of the public wish to address the council on item 12.7? Yeah, uh, Kirk Smith. Good evening again, Kirk. Yeah, um, my memory is that this came up before you uh, some time ago, a couple years ago, when council member Wendy Thomas owned the property. Is that the same property, Broadway Plaza, that she had? That is the same piece of property. Okay, and at that time, she was faced with the same issue that uh, there was work going to be done, and she was then going to have to pay for all of this design and implementation of curbs and sidewalks consistent with the demands uh, that was available before. You had a choice. You either did it some years ago or you wait until now, and you wait till now, and, of course, the cost of construction are went up much higher than the rate of inflation but why wasn't that paid up and, and it was um, i was in the audience at the time just kind of amazed that uh, the city was going to pay for for that design work to help lighten the load and and I, I gather from this discussion that this is because it's a federal grant that allows you to do that but how come it wasn't done uh, at the time when the demand was when it, when it came before you before and also, the way I read the agreement uh, is that when the demand is made on this uh, property owner, uh, that he or she would uh, be, it would only happen when demands are made on the others in the same area. And I think there's about four other properties. So why aren't they being considered at the same time? And when they are, are they going to get the same benefit of that kind of uh, design work that is the, is the case for Broadway Plaza? Uh, I know I just got through paying some money to do the same design work out of pocket. I guess the misfortune, there was no federal grant money for that area. But uh, I'd love to know how, how you're going to handle the other properties. Thank you. Thank you. We'll get to, we will get your questions answered. Any other member of the public wishing to address the council on 12.7? Seeing no one, I'll close the public comment on this item and bring it back to the council for discussion. Um, we had a couple of questions. Um, Ann McQuillan wanted to know about the removal of the landscaping. Uh, I'll turn to the city engineer to get that one answered. Yes, um, it, we will be preserving the landscaping that's there. We actually uh, have done some preliminary layouts, and uh, Ms. McQuillan is correct. We will be routing the sidewalk behind the trees. Um, that was something staff uh, felt pretty strongly about when laying out the Broadway sidewalks project. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that is still the intent. And then um, regarding uh, the timing of calling in this demand, mm -hmm. um, when we identified that the, there was a potential to utilize an SFIA for the project, um, and then once we actually started researching it, coincidentally, uh, that property changed ownerships to its current, current owner, mm -hmm. and uh, Ms. Thomas did not own it at the time that the city began pursuing this. Okay, thank you very much. Sure. Uh, I'm going to ask either Mr. Morris or Mr. Driscoll to, to uh, maybe expound on that a little bit, to clarify. Um, first of all, how many other um, sidewalk improvement, street frontage improvements are out there? Well, I mean, I'm going to look back at City Engineer also. You talk about the other properties. This is the only one within other, within the scope of this project. Is that, that correct, is correct. Rebecca, That yes. we have an SFIA on? Okay. So if we don't have the SFIA on, uh, the street frontage improvement agreement on those uh, then the project does the work for them so. okay and then as far as why didn't we uh, why wasn't this demand made in the past um, I remember the discussion and the demand being talked about I don't know that we actually issued the demand at that time but we talked about doing it uh, I do recall that the, the property had changed hands at the time it was just current owner that we were Correct. having that discussion with not not the former owners which was the, I believe the put off family the current owners have owned it approximately how long now a couple of years now actually a couple of years yeah we uh, this was back actually when um, uh, Ms. Ryerson was with the engineering division 
And I believe it was early of 2016, we actually went out and met with the current property owner and their property management company and had a, a discussion. And at that time, we you know, basically stated that the city is coming forth with the necessity to deliver a project in the interest of public safety and uh, that their component is a key piece in making that um, a contiguous path of travel. And uh, they were um, a, a little frustrated um, I do want to clarify that the SFIAs, the Street Frontage Improvement Agreements, are recorded. They are attached to the title and the deed. And, uh, and the current property owner at the time was uh, frustrated that he had missed that in the transaction with the deed. Um, but since then, you know, we, um, you know, as we try to do uh, for all of our businesses, we do try to work with everybody. And we do try to um, move forward in a proactive manner to, in, the, in the better interest of the public for the project. All right, very good. It just seems it seems reasonable at the time, as this project has had a long history, um, um, as it's been designed in in spurts and pieces, and so it uh, seems it seems very reasonable that we are where we are today because of the timing of it all. Yes, that's correct, Mr. Councilmember Morelli. Um, Rebecca, I would like to ask you. Um, you were talking about the landscaping, moving the sidewalk in the to the back yes, portion instead of going down. It would be right between the landscaping and Broadway. Correct. Right. So this way you're moving it on the other. But isn't don't the 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 way the cars park in that lot don't they pull into that? So that's not going to. The, it's still going to, there's plenty of room for yes. them to travel in the back, okay. So there's, you know, there's a, a few ways that you can prevent, um, you know, uh, the encroachment of vehicles onto a pedestrian path of travel. One of them is to, in, to install wheel stops. Um, you basically kind of pull the front axle of the vehicle back enough to where there is adequate clearance on the sidewalk. And um, as far as uh, having sufficient room, the drive aisle width of that parking lot is, and the parking stalls for that matter, are uh, quite a bit larger than what um, the city standard uh, requires, just even for a standard parking stall and parking drive aisle. So uh, we did a couple of preliminary layouts um, when we initially met with the property owner, showed them what we could do, and that looked like the direction that they were gonna wanna move forward. And so we, of course, um, thought it would be also beneficial to the community and the surrounding area to maintain the oh, landscaping. Absolutely. I, and I'm, I'm glad to hear that you're able to, because the landscaping is really nice up there. But yes. I was, you know, um, and I guess you're talking about the, I was concerned about the cars pulling, going too far into the sidewalk. And, yes. Yeah, so. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Good question, Patty, thank you. Councilmember Taylor. Um, so with the SFIA, am I understanding it correctly that when, when a property is sold, mm -hmm. an agreement like this is placed on it or when a building permit is pulled or? So typically what will happen is when we have an applicant come in for um, either development plan review or a building permit or conditional use permit, um, staff generates the conditions of approval and as part of the city code requirements, it includes the uh, construction of frontage improvements. The code does allow a provision to um, defer those improvements and go and in, enter into a street frontage improvement agreement. Um, you know, the benefit of it is if the developer doesn't have the funding uh, at the time, it becomes less cost prohibitive to still deliver a project that they would like and still at some point hold a placeholder uh, for those improvements. The other um, consideration of doing that is oftentimes, as in it is with this project, uh, when there is a street frontage improvement agreement, it's a placeholder for a future project that the city could come forth and deliver. The city, um, you know, may not have, uh, we may have a planning document in place, which is in the case of this project as it was. We have a planning document in place, but we don't have plans. We don't have an engineer at that time hired, and so then, when we do move forward with a planned project that the community supports, then we can call in those SFIAs. We have a couple of instances uh, throughout town where we um, will be doing that. One of them actually will be on your next council agenda for Upper Broadway as well. Okay, but that's the reason that not all the other properties are also subject to the same agreement. Okay. They, they would be if they went through the permitting process that city code would kick in and then SFIA would be required or, or just out, outright construction of the improvements. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Good question because they can be controversial, uh, SFIAs. I know um, in my old planning commissioner days, this was, they were quite the trick. 
But, it, you know, the, I think uh, Rebecca did a, answered that well because it does prevent an applicant from building a sidewalk to nowhere. Um, that because you you know you're waiting for adjoining parcels to develop and it, it keeps it's the placeholder so that when the facility is really truly needed then the, the the expectation has clearly been identified to the property owners that this will at some point in the future they are going to be responsible so um, they do have their uses um, if there's no other questions I had a couple of general Broadway sidewalk project questions we were provided another uh, beautiful exhibit again this evening on, on the project and in orange it shows proposed sidewalk and of course it shows all of that along Broadway Plaza and then across the street um, is my Chevron station and then the Chucks um, and then we go over to um, uh, Shoe Shoestring is, is that particular I see orange over there, Rebecca. Is that part of this project? Is this? Is, it are is. We, we're funding that. Yes, we are. <laughs> so there's there's a classic example of a um, you know we've done Blair's Lane and all that mm -hmm. curb return work and everything is in, um, and we come down to a sidewalk to nowhere basically at the moment. So part of this project will bridge that gap on the south side of Broadway. Yes, it does. There's quite a few gaps on. I mean, that's just way. one example. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. That that's probably the biggest and most onerous uh, non-streetscape-like piece of Broadway. I mean, that's just kind of ugly right in there. So well, there is adequate funding to, to yeah. install that sidewalk. Yes. So okay. the, the south side will go from was that Blair's Lane to basically to the hotel that's down there, um, or past that. So the south side is, in this particular instance, the south side is a lot of like gap closure improvements. Mm -hmm. You know, there is a fair amount of uh, sidewalk, sidewalk already in place on um, Broadway. One thing to consider, so you know, in looking at the off-ramp at Broadway, it didn't make sense to put a sidewalk there. So sidewalk was added um, where there would be uh, guided crossings, you know, for example, at Carson Road. I do want to point out one item, though. Um, we have, uh, due to the project considerations, we've actually removed the transit stop uh, at the consent of El Dorado County Transit. There would be potentially a future stop at a different location under a different project, but we would come back for that later. Um, but the sidewalk improvements that are located on the north side do address the, the gap in pedestrian facilities and one particular location that we're all I'm sure fond of is the one where it has the various steps that go above street grade and come back down um, it always makes us all a little nervous to see somebody pushing a baby stroller right about there so that would be addressed there would be a retaining wall place and then the sidewalk would be put at grade did that answer your question yes thank you sure. right, let's see well, are there any other questions um, uh, you know, when I first um, started to review this particular object, uh, proposal, it, it seemed to me because we are asking to do the creative design that we would call in the design part of the street frontage improvement because that allows us to make this extra work. It's not just straight down the curb line layout. And um, then go ahead and still leave the, what is it, $88,000 of the anticipated construction expenses in there thinking that um, or excuse me 87,000 that would free up funds to be is making sense those if we brought if we called the whole thing in we would maybe call in the construction part of it with us contributing the engineering work was my first thought on this but given the nature of the funding it sounds like we are not granting any special consideration we are going to make a motion that includes enforcement of this agreement so that it, we do need that additional money that will still be there. As far as calling in, uh, I, I'm going to try to repeat it because I want to make sure I heard you correctly. So just good luck. The, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> the question was regarding calling in the construction now versus later. Mm hmm. The reason why we haven't called in the construction now is because we um, there's a, a decent chance that it would be paid for through HSIP. As far as freeing up the additional funds for other items in the project, mm -hmm. 
we actually, um, and this is where HSIP having the only federal funding source that actually has money, <laughs> we actually have everything in here that we wanted okay. as part right. of the project description. That's a little different too. Yeah, That's yeah, nice. it's kind of nice. Very nice. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm glad that uh, you know we had this discussion and brought those extra facts out. Is any other questions? If we're no, that we're satisfies. Uh, we wanna, this. We're going to want to make sure that we make this motion. Um, we, with the understanding that we, uh, as outlined by City Attorney Driscoll, mm -hmm. this was Michael. Were you thinking about making a motion and then to? As a staff recommendation ordered correctly, Mr. Driscoll, to ensure, uh, as it's written right now, that the the agreement will remain in force for the construction portion of the funds. Let me look at it again. That would be safe. Yeah. Well, while well, they're double checking that, Rebecca, what would you anticipate our construction on this particular project? Um, as I mentioned uh, earlier, we would be finalizing design in May with uh, bidding in July, August. Um, so yeah, June kind of gets yeah. sucked up into the federal process, unfortunately. Oh, yeah. Um, so we would submit our request for construction, our request for authorization for construction funds in June. Mm -hmm. And when we receive what is called our authorization, our E76 form, we would then be able to let the project out for bidding. So this project will come before you again, requesting for permission to bid um, later on. And uh, construction would be starting approximately in September, and it concludes roughly around November. Yeah, so it would happen this year. That's that's the game plan. Barring federal shutdowns. Right. Yeah, HSIP is pretty aggressive funding source. Right. Thank you for that. And in, in response to the mayor's question, yes, the resolution paragraph one is worded just fine. Oh, here you go. All right, thank you. Well, I'm glad we double checked, Mr. Or, excuse me, Vice Mayor Saragosa. Would you like to make a motion? Yeah, so I'll I'll make a motion that we adopt uh, the resolution uh, of the placement of demand. I'll second it. All right, seconded by Councilmember Borelli. A roll call vote, please. Mayor Acuna. Aye. Councilmember Borelli. Aye. By Vice, Ma Vice Mayor Saragosa. Aye. Council Member Taylor. Aye. Thank you. All right, motion carries. Uh, would someone please retrieve Council Member Thomas from the Chamber of Silence? <laughs> and thank you, Anne, for sitting through this. And we look forward to um, preserving the landscape, installing the sidewalk. Um, we have high hopes for the Chuck's property. Hint, hint, hint. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Welcome back, Councilmember Thomas. I just shuffled myself right out of order here. All right. Well, we've already dealt with item 12.8. So, gosh, we're almost done 12.9. Uh, adopt a capital lease agreement to Opus Bank in the amount of 257000 and plus for a five-year term for some equipment purchasing. Good evening, Mr. Warren. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. You may recall at your meetings held on November 13th and November 27th of last year, the council discussed the city's equipment replacement needs for the next five years and beyond. Um, on November 27th, the council appropriated $78,098 for immediate replacement of seven pieces of equipment with cash and authorized staff to obtain financing options for 13 additional pieces of equipment that need to be replaced this year. On December 21st of 2018, the Finance Department issued a request for proposal for equipment lease purchase financing in the amount of $258,700 for a term of five years for 13 pieces of equipment. The RFP was distributed to 11 quality lending institutions the city did receive uh, three <coughs> proposals, and uh, Opus Bank was determined to be the lowest responsive, responsible bidder. The RFP assumed the financing of three Dodge Chargers in the amount of $122,598 and a network server for police department in the amount of $10,831, which was discussed at your previous council meeting. Um, due to the actual cost of the three patrol vehicles being $9,993 more than 
we originally anticipated and built into the RFP, staff is recommending that $10,831 network server be excluded from the capital lease. Um, staff has identified $10,831 in savings uh, within the existing general fund capital outlay budget that can be used to purchase the network server. Um, so that's taken care of. The uh, proposed equipment lease with Opus Bank has an interest rate um, an annual APR of 3.16% over a five-year period. Um, and that was a pleasant surprise because before we issued the RFP, we were quoted around 4.05%. So there was preferable rates in December to our favor. The annual debt service, including principal interest, will be uh, $56,372.90. Um, there is a one-time $1,000 documentation fee that would have to be paid upon execution of the lease. This cost can be absorbed by the operating budget. The first semi-annual payment would be due in October of 2019. Um, the total cost of the lease, including principal, interest, and documentation fees, would be $282,864.54 to replace uh, those 13, 12 pieces of equipment. If approved tonight, staff will incorporate um, the $56,372 in additional debt service payments within the proposed fiscal year 1920 operating budget as shown on page three of your staff report. If the council approves the pro proposed equipment lease tonight, staff will finalize the lease equipment agreement and return to the council with equipment purchase proposals for the council's consideration as necessary. The draft uh, master agreement and property schedule forms provided by Opus Bank were included with the staff report. Um, there are several exhibits to the property schedule that are not attached and are subject to further negotiation, including such things as insurance and prepayment uh, penalties. With that, staff recommends that the City Council award the capital lease to Opus Bank in the amount of $257,862 for a term of five years and an annual uh, APR interest rate of 3.16% to finance the equipment mm -hmm. and also authorize the city manager to negotiate and execute uh, the said capital lease agreement and any other documentation related to the financing. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Dave. Excellent and detailed report as always. And let's see now, to be clear, these are three additional patrol cars. Those are three replacement vehicles. Three replacement vehicles. And, and they're on the property, as I understand it. Yes, they are. Uh, the chief uh, was able to exp expedite those purchases very quickly because of another agency that canceled their order. And I know the chief covered that. So, Excellent. Yep. All right. Is there any questions for the council? from the council for Mr. Warren on this item? There's always more, but this is a good start. Uh, I'll open this up for public comment on item 12.9, the capital lease of some equipment. And invite any member of the public to come forward and comment on this. Sue Rodman, resident of Placerville. Um, what Dave doesn't didn't say is there's also three trucks for the public works department in this. One for thirty-three thousand, one for thirty-five thousand, one for thirty-four thousand. I think. Um, I think we've got twelve pieces of equipment here. The police department, I think, has done their homework to get an excellent deal and pay for the required safety equipment without having to finance that. So I'd say hats off to Chief Ortega and. Commander Joe Wren. Wren. And the savings within the general fund outlays that can be used to purchase the network service is very good. That's great, too. I do have some questions on the other equipment proposed for the capital lease. With the savings from item 8.6 of $32,542 in community services, could that savings be used to purchase one of the three public work trucks, adding only $458 to the savings in item 8.6 would purchase the $33,000 truck? Or another option would be instead of financing the four servers 
at thirteen thousand dollars four hundred sixty three and the two meter reader handheld units at nine thousand eight oh eight for a total of twenty three thousand two seventy one could they be purchased from that thirty two thousand dollars five hundred forty two savings from item eight point six and you would still have nine thousand two hundred seventy one dollars remaining um, financing costs at three point one for five years is $25,080.54. This cost is the interest paid for debt service. And while 3.16 is not an unreasonable interest rate, $25,000 is not just pocket change. The 54 cents is pocket change, but the 25,000 is not pocket change. It's a significant share of the cost of any of the single vehicles on this list. And it's more than the total cost of the four printers and the four handheld and the two handheld meters. Meter readers. So I really urge the city to follow the fire department lead here and to get our equipment replacement on a pay as you go basis instead of a in debt as you go basis. Thank you, Sue. Appreciate your uh, analyzing the, uh, the purchase agreement and for your comments. Is there any other member of the public wishing to address the council on this item? Seeing no one approaching the podium, I'll close public comment on this item and bring it back to the council. Cleve, could you address um, Sue's comments, in or you or Mr. Warren, regarding the... Uh, I'll, let, the I'll let Dave address those now oh. too, if need be. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, good comments, good questions. Um, the first thing is, is that when we discussed this, and I know we have some new council members here tonight, but back in November, um, we actually presented um, the summary of a document that's 39 pages uh, of all of our equipment. We have, of, and this is non-fixture type equipment, $3.7 million of, of equipment that eventually depreciates and you have to replace it. So we broke that up over a six, six well, uh, five years and then five plus years. And so in 1819 fiscal year, which we're in right now, we had $812,160 in equipment. So if we replaced everything we're supposed to right now, we would spend $816,000, well beyond what this financing does. So. And this was really a follow-up discussion to our budget deliberations last spring um, because we realized that on a pay-as-you-go basis, uh, we would have to actually cut services uh, to provide that level of funding out of your, as on a pay-as-you-go basis. So um, the other thing, why did we get to $812,000 $812, in equipment replacement? We've deferred purchases, and this is a continuation um, we talk about pensions, the fact that the Great Recession and the losses in um, interest returns, uh, in, uh, investment losses, um, we're still paying for that. Uh, one of the things that we did as a short stopgap measure during the Great Recession was defer purchases of equipment. Um, during the recession, cash is king, and anything you can do to um, slow down the outflow of cash you do, and we tried to be as prudent as possible. It didn't mean we didn't replace equipment, but we certainly uh, uh, deferred several pieces of equipment being replaced, so that has built up and we're still catching up. So the savings um, from the one vehicle, where do you, where do you start? Uh, certainly not with those things that are on the, in my opinion, on the capital lease list. Um, these are high uh, things that need to be immediately replaced. Um, and just to be very clear, the chief has done a great job in finding a really good deal on the three police cars, but they are being financed. They are included in the lease. So what the lease allows us to do, if it's approved tonight, is to purchase those vehicles and then get reimbursed through the lease. Um, so um, the hundred. $32,000 in total, $38,000 in costs will be reimbursed to the city and then financed through this capital lease. I think that's everything. 
believe, unless I miss yeah. something. The other thing I want to point out is you need to remember that some of these are coming from different funds. So, for example, the meter handheld meter readers um, are from water and sewer. That's correct. 100%, right, Dave? Uh, the savings that we realized from the cash purchases we did were out of general fund. We don't want to mix those two. So, in other words, we would be, if we bought those meter readers out of that savings that we had, we would be subsidizing our water and sewer funds with general fund, and I don't recommend that you do that. So there's other complications besides that that you need to look at that we're not mixing those funds that you approved. There were savings because we recognized we didn't have to purchase that, uh, purchase that other vehicle. The other thing that Dave is, trying to, is, is saying here is that we're, we're not done. We're going to be coming back to you as part of the budget with other items. Uh, we have, really have not truly addressed the computer needs. We've done our serious needs, but there are still a lot more that we come in for you. You heard the $800,000 number. We've attacked maybe close to 300000 of that through this lease and through the outright purchases that we did, the cash purchases that we did. So there's still a number of needs. We'll probably, I will tell you, we'll probably need to come back to you with another uh, lease purchase our option in attempt to try to catch up and get back in line with all of our equipment needs and that's one way that can, we can do it. If we had the cash to just purchase it and pay as you go, absolutely that would that would be our recommendation and, and Mr. Warren and I have talked about that and uh, tried to look at ways that we can eventually get to that where we can do that but it's going to we are so far behind in those equipment purchases that it's going to take some time to slowly move back into that where we can where we can do that. And as you know, we have a lot of other expenses with our retirement costs and et cetera we're going to be looking at over the next five years that are going to be a struggle to balance with uh, those equipment needs. So that's why we're recommending that we not use any more of that cash. We, we probably will come back with your recommendation whether it be to do outright purchases with that approximately $20,000 savings that we have or whether it's that we just that goes into reserves and we look at future lease purchases for the equipment is still uh, out there as far as what we exactly recommend but that will be coming back to you probably as part of this this fiscal year budget that we're coming up to so well, thank you both for that additional information is there any questions from council members would someone like to make a motion on this item well I appreciate the shout out on the uh, the fire district however the, the the situations with the fire district were were significantly different with not nearly as uh, challenging of issues as we have here uh, but with the fire they they, they actually uh, we uh, removed about 50 percent of our uh, administrative staff and and cut health care cut across the board in in the retirement and a lot of participation from from the firefighters to get us to where we were um, I think the city has done that quite a bit over the years to to preserve our resources and get us where we're at so the shout outs great I think that the that the challenge is, is significantly different here at the city and um, so I just, that's mine and with that I would uh, actually I'm not gonna do anything here I could I make a comment? I just want to address what Cleve was saying too. This is exactly what we ask for. We, you know, we're so far behind, and we, for I'm going to say the last two years, this is what we've been suggesting, and I, I really commend um, our staff and her for figuring this out how we can do it because we we can't just keep kicking the can down the road. So, thank you. I will make the motion if. I'll second it. Moved by Councilmember Borelli and seconded by Councilmember Taylor. Um, I know I just just in a, a, one last question, maybe to Mr. Warren or Mr. Morris, is uh, how many employees are we down from the Great Recession? You are currently down about eighteen percent. Eighteen percent. Yes. That we have not replaced. So we're still this far behind on all of our equipment needs, and we still have an an eighteen percent staffing issue to still providing the same level of services though with our current staff generally yes that's yeah. correct it's a true statement so yeah it's a diff it's difficult it's very difficult so yeah i think some people are working longer hours yeah <laughs> so um thank you for your hard work on this there's been a motion so i'll ask the city clerk to please call uh, for the vote mayor acuna aye council member borelli aye 
Vice Mayor Saragossa? Aye. Council Member Taylor? Aye. Council Member Thomas? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you very much. And we, one of these days, the chief will actually bring one of those cars out, and we'll get to see it. Okay. Do I get to do I get to drive? Oh no! How is the back seat with you, Chief? And the lights on and up and down Main Street. All right. Uh, we've had a long, busy meeting here. Uh, item 13: Council reports. From other agency meetings and uh, El Dorado Transit right up there at top. Um, welcome, Councilmember Taylor, to uh, the Transit Board. And we found out sadly that the Executive Director Mindy Jackson is re has announced her retirement, effective May of this year. Uh, mm -hmm. Twenty-five years she has served as the Executive Director at El Dorado Transit. I mean, she is and El Dorado Adler. Transit, <laughs> and I'm hoping that through the retirement process. Um, somebody find some uh, some pictures of what the agency looked like and the buses and the facilities that I mean it's world-class now and it started out on a shoestring so she certainly had a stellar career hate to see her go but totally understand um, so uh, that's the news from transit everything is good El Dorado County Transportation Commission I understand that uh, Councilmember Borelli was successfully elected as the chair I this was. year yep. Is there, was, do we have a report? Um, I have um, our, the executive director's report in front of me. Um, I would really like to suggest that if folks are interested, this is just such a wonderful agency that they go on their website and see oh, okay. all the things that they're doing. Uh, Very good. We talked about, uh, you know, several, like the Broadway sidewalk project. We And the hot spot, uh, Dennis, you already mm -hmm. gave the report on what, Caltrans folks had to say about that and we heard about some of their projects that have been finished admirably and uh, anyway it, it's a great um, I think commission and they, it is so well run and they just um, I they do so much and in our city and our county then they work so well together that we've got some great projects because of it so thank you Thank you, Patty. And, that, and yeah, the executive director's report does have tons of great information. Um, LAFCO, uh, we actually had a very interesting LAFCO meeting last month regarding the uh, fire district consolidations of various fire districts. Um, the smaller ones are in financial trouble, um, well attended. There are numerous efforts that are going on right now. And of course, one of the big ones is it's going to take some time and that'll depend on the county's desire to go into the fire for the fire uh, suppression business. They currently don't do that. So that'll be an interesting topic. Um, and in regards to LAFCO in general, one of the things that um, the executive director um, has been asked to do this year is actually pick a time to come to a future city council meeting and kind of explain what his agency does. So uh, be thinking about when, I thought maybe we could do it in April, when, just before we get deep into budget. So um, maybe I'll ask the city clerk to, to uh, do some polling and we'll set, set up a presentation on uh, what Eldorado LAFCO is, is doing. Um, SACOG. Vice uh, Mayor Saragossa. Yes, um, so the, just the, the one thing that really uh, stood out is they're gonna, you know, we've talked about the, the price increase for us to be participants. Well, they've now kind of come out with a plan B that makes it a little bit softer of a, a cost that was going to be sort of spread out over a couple of, of years before it kind of fully ramps up. Um, I thought we should have just gone ahead with it and just do it because it just puts us further behind in terms of cost because it's it was like three thousand dollars I think for for us but it's gonna be a I think like a two-step process before we we get to that final cost um, and then we just uh, went over a little bit on uh, you know hitting our GHG goals for the region which you know for Placerville it's a de minimis amount that uh, is really going to be the, the larger cities that are going to bear the brunt of that but uh, that's about it Thank you, Michael. And then, of course, we had a two-by-two two meeting. I'm going to ask Councilmember Thomas to report out on that. <clears throat> we, uh, the, the, the primary uh, discussion point, at least as it relates to the city, initially is the, the discussion of the homeless. And um, 
And one of the things that, <clears throat> let's see, Daniel DeMonte, who is the, mm -hmm. mm, he's up there at the health department. <laughs> he, he's, a, I believe, a, a deputy or assistant director of the uh, Health and Human yeah. Services. Right. Yeah. Uh, thank you. And he, he gave us a presentation on basically what's happening with the, with the two plus or minus million dollars. And his discussion was, was enlightening, disappointing. Um, it, basically, you can't throw two million, two million dollars at a problem like this and still get the results that we want. It takes uh, a lot more money to effectively run a program to help shelter and and deal with homelessness in our community, and yet uh, we also have to maintain the programs that were that that are in place that help help us get the money uh, in terms of the um, federal grant money that we have to have in place. Um, and I, you know, what I've heard I've heard people's comments uh, at previous meetings where they're frustrated with the lack of visibility and actual. Um, getting things done i get it and at the same time i get the challenge same challenges that the uh, health department is having and the county is having in implementing this program uh, at the end of the discussion i think we glean uh, we're trying to run a horse race with a pony and that we're really not uh, going to get everything we want in this we're going to get some movement and hopefully this helps us move the ball down the field where more money will come in and help us uh, do this the uh, the the thing that people want to happen with homelessness is not really the most effective way and ultimately help the homeless to that finish line as effectively in terms of percentages. The, the highest percentage rate is the rapid rehousing where you put somebody in a home, you help them with all the facilities and the needs that they have. But the cost, and the cost goes down, but the initial cost to do the rapid rehousing is significant. And so that is, uh, you know, that's their goal is moving towards that. And uh, it's not going to happen this year. And they're really working hard, harder than I realized to make that happen. So that's it on that. <clears throat> Thank you, Dennis. Requests for future agenda items. Are there any requests for future agenda items this evening from the council? I'll just, I know it, it's, it's been a while again, but still like to have a, a PG&E representative come talk to us. Oh, yes. um, we just saw the, their latest rollout where, you know, that they may be doing more of these uh, blackouts on a, on a quicker trigger, if you will, uh, going forward. Uh, and so I think it's incumbent that we really have a good conversation with them, understand what could be happening going forward and, um, and then having that larger discussion as well, I think, with Caltrans and CHP Absolutely. as it affects the, the corridor that bisects our city. So that's an excellent idea. Um, Mr. Morris, did you? Uh, that is scheduled for your next meeting. They've agreed to be here. So. No, Great. Oh. Fantastic. <laughs> now oh, ask, ask for a whole bunch of money and see if they have that. <laughs> um, along that same line, I think it would be appropriate um, and with the stormy weather and what have you, uh, I've gotten a little distracted and behind on some things. But the Fire Safe Council is off to a really great start. Um, David Zelensky has um, really taken that out of the gate. We had a very highly well attended uh, little just a informational workshop um, last month. That was really, uh, that with, was great. This room was packed yes, at the beginning was. of that. Um, so, Clay, what it would be, or what would be the council's thoughts on asking the Fire Safe Council to come? Um, here soon while the weather is still favorable for clearing and you mean you. the you don't mean the Placerville fire the one we're just uh -huh. starting yeah they ask them to come to the and welcome them and and see what they can tell us about Please. yeah I'm I'm fine with that I, I think it may be a little bit <coughs> premature let them get their their feet yeah, going that's underneath that's them and um, I did I am looking at setting up a meeting with them uh, and the Steve Willis who is the county director for the fire safe council and and perhaps the fire district also to talk about you know how do we work together how do we coordinate all of these things together and what they're doing what we're doing etc um, uh, so that we're not duplicating efforts that we're all working together on it so i'm i think maybe after we hold that meeting uh, on that level then perhaps invite them to come and 
show us what what they plan to do and what they would like to do. Yeah, because they really are just organizing. Right. Right. And do we have a time frame on our ordinance coming back? Um, we're we're kind of waiting on on the county now. They took a step back and kind of changed what they were doing, but I'm I'm hoping. I'm hoping very soon. I, I don't know what very soon is yet, but I'm hoping uh, as early as in the month of March to get that back to you. So, okay, so maybe Sooner we could tentatively say we'll try and meet with the Fire Safe Council in April. Yeah, giving them some time to give a couple more meetings. Again, a really nice, really nice turnout and organization developing there. So I certainly appreciate their efforts. Um, if there are okay, city manager and staff reports. I want to. I want to follow through with my suggestion that we talk to the post office. Okay. <laughs> That's not necessarily a future agenda item, but no. We'll, but we'll, I just want to okay. know we'll, that we're still. We'll see what we do. Yeah, sure. We're not going to drop it. Sure. Um, under staff reports, uh, I don't think we have anything other than I sent an email to all of you today or yesterday today Maybe about the uh, workshop. Uh, goal setting workshop oh, yeah. suggesting the week of March 18th um, we're, we're open staff wise uh, our, our preference would be kind of an afternoon meeting but we recognize you have obligations <laughs> if that doesn't work um, we're, we'll do whatever is necessary um, I heard from a couple of you uh, Mayor Kuhn I think is you have plans for the 17th through the 19th is that the dates I recall yes sir uh, I didn't Council get Member, the email yet but by the, okay. so I haven't read it <laughs> okay <laughs> Council Member Taylor I know you said Monday or Friday is best for you correct mm -hmm. okay anyone uh, else have any I have to look Okay. Okay. I'll, I'll it, you. Just just so you know, yeah. If you get back to me on that, and then I'll I'll set the day. I need to make sure that we can use a room here for that, um, and then we'll we'll go from there. We would have the department heads there, Clay. Yes. Just so you know, what we are what we would like to do. I'm going to ask each of my department heads, and they're hearing that this somewhat for the first time. So I apologize. Um, is for them to list their projects that they are working on. Um, some of those you already know. Um, I have a, a pretty extensive list that I want to give you and, and what we're going to ask you to do is each department will review those projects that they're working on but then in the end uh, some of these major ones I want you to help us prioritize because uh, I know at least from my end and I know some of the other department heads are running into conflicts with uh, time constraints on, on getting everything done and so we want you to tell us what, what are your priorities and what can we recognize if we have to set something to the side that it gets delayed for a period of time so that's kind of the format of what we'd like to do at this uh, at this uh, goal setting workshop so. excellent look forward to it yeah. it's always and then it'll be a, a time limit because before budget it'll help us have that information as we head into the budget exercise that's always very very useful all right is there any other reports Dave? All right, moving on to 16, <clears throat> excuse me, upcoming items. We have a number of them uh, for our next meeting on the 26th. Um, the Civic Lab presentation, looking forward to that. Railroad Drive Paving Contract Award, Lower Airport Paving Contract. The Pacific Street Project close out, great success. A Street Furniture Improvement Agreement uh, for the Upper Broadway Bike Lane Project. Uh, the Upper Bri Upper Broadway Bike Lane's REY Contract Amendment, MBI Contract Amendment and truck purchases in the annual crime report. We look forward to that. So with there being no other business uh, scheduled this evening, I will go ahead and adjourn the council to our rec next regularly scheduled meeting on February 26th, 5.30 p.m. closed session, 6 p.m. regular session. Thank you and good night.